just hanging in there and not losing any more distance. So I think that was a good call by the tactician there on American Cube. Current has been a big factor as well as the wind and the swell and the chop. Part of the current caused by the full moon. Right now, Jim, the current is going... Right now, the current is going in this direction here, making go around the mark. Now, when they come around the mark and head downwind, they'll be fighting against the current, which is in this direction. So it makes the first leg a little shorter because they're going with the current. It makes the second leg a little longer because they're going against it. And current makes, has a big effect on these boats. One knot of current equals what, about 10 knots of wind? Right, it takes about 10 knots of breeze to overcome one knot of current. It'll also make the boats round wide as they go past this mark. Another historic moment coming up. This will be the first time that a boat from Italy has led at the first mark in an America's Cup final. Signals there to skipper Paul K.R. Gabrielle Bassetti down in the sewer. And this team going with a spinnaker. <laughs> Sandro Spaziani working down in the pit working on the sails and here comes america cubed and there is the citizen timing ticking on down as jerry kirby works there i'll tell you what men we have seen something in this america's cup we never saw in australia peter eisler dennis connor tom Whitten, the men on us 55 they never trailed at any mark when they swept kookaburra four nil america cubed they led at every mark yesterday but they are behind in race two at the first mark by 33 seconds Having a little trouble getting that spinnaker going. Both boats having spinnakers. There they go. So the slam dunk by Kayard. Good steering after that. A half a minute. The differential at the top mark. What do you expect on the run with the spinnakers out? Well, yesterday I thought America Cube was a little bit faster sailing downwind. So maybe she has a chance to catch up. But the pressure definitely on Bill Coke and team now. Three and a quarter nautical miles downwind with the spinnakers out a long way to go. Six more legs after this. Lots of racing. Italy in the lead trying to even the series. Looks like America Cube sailing a little bit faster on this downwind run. She was a little bit faster yesterday and it seems to be working. The speed differential yesterday. Upwind, USA 23. Two seconds faster upwind on the reaching legs through the chicane. Italy closed. That gain, three seconds and downwind, and that's where we are right now. USA 23 was two seconds faster. Now, Peter, you wouldn't be surprised to see 23 kind of rocket ship past. How come? Jim, I think that that two-second number there, once we see a few more races between these two boats, will grow. I believe America Cube's biggest advantage is in on the downwind legs. They've already closed up maybe a boat length and a half so far. If they can get it a little bit closer, they will be able to start to attack the wind of El Moro. What is it, Peter, that makes 23 faster, in your opinion? The shape of the sails, the shape of the boat, they're spying? <laughs> the Gazzini, Jim. All the Gazzini. Actually, the shape of the boat, the very narrow hull shape, American Cube much narrower than Il Moro. That helps it when they're going straight downwind. Less drag, less friction with the water. Right now, from the air, it looks like America Cube on the left definitely gaining, like sailing a lower course and going quite well. Let's listen to Bill Coke. He's still at the wheel. We're headed down to the bottom mark around turn number two, and then we'll head back to windward again for the second time. Eight legs. Of course, it was America Cube ousting Team Dennis Connor in a best of 13 for the Defender finale. First time that Dennis Connor has not been in the America's Cup finale since 1980. Here's Gary. 
Once upon a time, a long time ago, well, a year ago, a long time in America's Cup terms, Dennis Conner christened Stars and Stripes in a patriotic affair with his daughter Shauna taking the honors. We to see Stars and Stripes. Across the bay, Bill Koch and America Q, promises of a technological campaign unprecedented in yachting history. As the trials begin, America Cube's second boat, Defiant, is launched. Alongside Jayhawk, the battle for national pride begins. Stars and Stripes versus America Cube. Sense versus Dollars. Experience versus Science. The Tortoise versus the Hare. It's only January, but one thing is apparent to Connor and his crew. Modifications must be made. Round two means another Cuban christening and another crisis for Connor. Dennis pulls his boat and explains to Peter why the tandem keel didn't work. The problem was that the boat was not able to hold itself up into the line of the wind. It was making too much leeway. And whether it was because the leading edge was too fine and wasn't quite right, or there was not enough lateral resistance to keep the boat from going sideways, we're really not sure. Round three, no new boats, but a ton of trouble for the Connor camp. Breaking a mast looks like the end but the all-night effort readies the boat and rekindles the faith in their never-say-die skipper. And he leads from the front and encourages all his guys to be, you know, to have that same drive. So, you know, we're there because we know Dennis is, is not going to make a half-hearted attempt to win the next round. Round four and boat four cans and makes her way to San Diego. While modify is the only word in Old Glory's vocabulary. The surgery is a success. Ed Connor's racing luck, experience, and winning the sail off, he's all of a sudden posing a threat in the final. I wish I had Dennis's luck and my money. <laughs> <laughs> in the defender final, Connor is overmatched and in the unfamiliar role as underdog. Oh, yeah, no problem laying the mark. He's just fast. Down 3 0. The sky is open. The winds die and the sun shines down. The score is temporarily even at 4. Get him in 95. But luck can only go so far. And in this story, the hair never let up. It's been a year since Sean and Connor set the boat a sail. It's amazing how one hole can last so long. Now father and daughter can only watch the U.S. effort change hands as science has won out. Will Coke and America Cube keep the cup in America? You bet your ass it will. <laughs> Back on board, that is Robert Hopkins, who actually took the blame for making the missed call on the current yesterday in the pre-start. Well, after that missed call, he's calling it accurately right now, and America Cube on the left definitely catching up here. They're doing a good job on this run. How much ground have they made up to your eye, Peter? Jim, it looks like they've made up maybe as much as half the lead at the top mark. And America Q, like what they see getting near the ley line, is jiving first. Again, Italy in front by 33 seconds at the top mark. The key during these jives is to keep the sails full. America Cube's spinnaker seems to collapse a little bit here. The Italian's doing a better job on this exchange. It was interesting, Gary. That was a sneak jibe on the part of America Cube. No one moved on the boat, but he just started turning the boat, and then they sprang into action. They didn't want to tip off the Italians if they were thinking of turning. Sneak jibe, Peter? They're basically trying to catch the Italians' surprise and try to get turned without the Italians making the move that they did. But the Italians saw the move and jibed simultaneously, covering from ahead, stay, staying between America Cube and the bottom mark. A little trouble on the spinnaker pole on America Q. Now, finally, you can see the spinnaker going forward to where it's supposed to be set. You have to keep the sail right up against the pole under the rules. And now they get it in a proper position. Both boats going along just under nine knots. Italy's still in front, but their lead has been just about sliced in half. Jim. Jim, you can see there that it was only about two boat lengths between the boats. Now, they're still about 60% of the way to go. They've got to sail in this direction, and we'll probably see a number of jives on the way down before rounding the mark and heading back upwind. Paul K.R. 
He was the Port Taylor on Tom Blackoller's unsuccessful defense effort back when he was aboard USA. The Port Trimmer. He's the skipper this year. that Bill Koch rents for $30,000 a month, and that is the statue called Roseanne by some of the neighbors, some affectionately, some not so affectionately. Some wanted it moved, and Koch threatened to maybe turn Roseanne around, let him look at the other side for a while. That is Bill working the sheet over on the port side. White pants, white shirt, white hat that yesterday had an ice pack under it, conked on the noggin, dazed by Baldridge, said he tried to help him get up and calm him down a little bit, get his thoughts collected. America Q definitely going very well. Both boats have jived onto port as they continue downwind. And the difference here, America Q seems to sail a little bit of a lower course than El Moro. Still about two-thirds of a mile to the next bar. Italy leading at the top mark by 33 seconds, the first time that a boat from that country has led in an America's Cup final. We might have the first wager in America's Cup history. Peter Eisler's put some money on the table. He thinks we might have a pass here on this run. How come, Pedro? I just see America Cube going very, very fast right now. Paul Kehart's made a bold move by jiving away. There has been a bit of a wind shift. But it looks to me right now that without the starboard advantage of El Moro, America Cube is already in front. I'm surprised that K.R. elected to jive away when he was still in the lead. With the wind shifting on the downwind leg here, K.R. can be patient and wait for what's called the lift, where the wind turns to his left, and that'll let him catch up using the wind, but that's a risky bolt move. It's 50-50. If it goes his way, he's ahead. If it goes the other way, he's behind. Paul Kayard has been training for this moment for 25 years. He grew up in the San Francisco area, sailing El Toros, won North American championships when he was his, in the teens, sailed and course tutored under the late Tom Blackaller. But he has also borne the brunt of Bill Koch's wrath. Bill Koch saying, I can't imagine myself sailing for Italy and carrying an Italian green card. Kayard's response? I have no relationship with Bill Koch. You know, I have nothing in common with Bill Koch. Um, he's wealthy, I'm not. I'm a professional sailor, and he's not. Um, I have a lot in common with Buddy Melgis, and a lot of the good sailors that I uh, know over there on America Cubed. I've been in America's Cups with Mike Topa, who's the starboard tailor over there, um, with Tom in 83, and a lot, Jerry Kirby, and all those guys have crewed for me in various regattas, and I have a lot of respect for them, and they have a good team. Bill is doing, Bill's trying to play the, the game however he thinks is best, and um, I know he's an intelligent man, and uh, he's a very well-educated man, and uh, he's, he's just doing whatever he thinks is best. Uh, can't really, I don't really understand everything he does, but that's not, uh, that's not perfect. And doesn't seem too concerned about anything he does. Paul Kayard being taught the global perspective by Mr. Gardini says, when I walk away from this America's Cup, I'll feel like I've gained a lot, like I've got a master's degree from the University of Life. The red hull belongs to the challenger, the white hull to the defender. Best of seven, America's Cup 92, the red hull trailing one race to none, but leading in this race. Well, Jim, it seems that America Cube is sailing a lower course toward the mark. They're going off in this direction here. The Italian's actually sailing a course like this. And as a result, when KR jives over, it's going to be very close to see whether he's ahead of America Q. Talking about Paul KR's lesson, I think Professor Koch is teaching him a lesson or two right now on this downwind leg. Thanks to the design team of America Q, they have a very fast boat on this leg. Dave Dellenbaugh. The 
got some nice pressure back here. Pressure means more wind. two crews eyeballing each other. As the boats get closer, they spend more and more time looking at each other, which could be a mistake. You want to concentrate on your job. seen a lead change I think they're just about dead even or a three might be nudging slightly ahead I agree with you Tim I think Gomorrah is going to have a hard time coming back on starboard jive and make their right of way pay so heading to this mark what what can we anticipate what does that mean Peter well right now Gomorrah if the boats are even as Bill Coke has just reported to us or as a boat like the head they'll come back eventually turning to the right getting gaining starboard tack and the right of way and they will have the inside position so they're in a great position right now if they can go fast enough but right now america cube is continuing to gain and if Omoro doesn't jive soon they may let this lead slip away at some point when you're losing you have to go over and attack the other boat and if paul is behind he's got to go after the sail blocking america cube's breeze and the longer they wait because america cube sailing faster the worse it's going to be for Omoro. side by side buddy milk is kind of studying the sails on el moro ita 25 the red hull in front by 33 seconds at the top mark we're on the run the spinnakers are out coming into the bottom mark mark number two race two of the america's cup italy trying to square things up one all that is stars and stripes from Fremantle. heart pounding excitement this is the america's cup I'm Gary Jobson, and when I want the inside story, I turn to the official program of America's Cup 92, published by Yachting. And now you can, too. Inside this collector's edition souvenir program is everything you'll need to know. The Cup's history, the race course, and the competitors. It's all here, the story of winners and the beautiful boats they sail. Call today and get your copy for only $5. Back live in the Pacific, race two, best of seven, Italy trailing, but they're leading in this race. We're on the run, Italy playing catch up, and we've got a good jiving duel going on, but A3 having some problems the last two jives. Peter Eisler, how come? They've been, Buddy's been turning the boat very, very fast, trying to attack the wind of Ilmora. This is the second time they've converged. Watch his turn now. He's going to try to block the wind of Ilmora. doing a nice job jiving away. Now the key here is keeping the spinnaker full. Notice America Cube on the right, the spinnaker collapses. It loses its wind and as a result, the boat loses speed. Omoro on the right doing a better job keeping the sail full. But I think Peter, you're exactly right, but he's simply turning the boat too fast. That hurts, that's the third job in a row that America Cube spinnaker has collapsed, lost wind when they jive. But Kart's doing the right thing. He's protecting the left side looking downwind. He'll have the inside advantage when they approach the bottom mark as well as starboard tack right of way. Now it's a tactician's job to analyze the rate of turn of the boat. And if you turn too fast, David Delmbass will say, buddy, take three more seconds to make the turn so you don't make that same mistake. And they do it again on the right. That's the fourth time. I can't understand what's going on here. Every time, Omoro gains half a boat length because the Italian trimmers are doing a great job driving their spinnaker. It's funny because yesterday the Italians were having trouble. Here 
here as they come together. Talia has the right of way, but they still have to make one more jive to round the mark. This time, Kayard will not jive away. He'll continue. No more turns, just to the mark. And another collapse by America Q. And look at this, the luck. If they hit, America Cube is wrong. There was a collision. Just the sail of A3, right, Peter? The sail swung over and hit Italy. Protest flag up. That's what Paul Kerr was waving his hands about. He spun his boat up. And the, it appears the sail hit. The umpires make the call, though. The spinnaker of A3 swung over and hit one of the lines on Italy. There's the protest flag Green up. Green flag. No foul, no penalty. How can that be? Peter? Well, the umpires were in a much better position than we were in. But right now, American Cube is paying for more than a penalty turn. They're completely out of control, losing boat lengths. Gary, why the green flag? How could that be? Well, I think what happened, Jim, is the umpires were looking at the boats, not up at the top of the mast of sails where they might have hit. But the big mistake here is not American Cube not anticipating the turn. These are different umpires than we had in either the Louis Vuitton Challenger Series or the America's Cup Series. So they're getting used to it. Look at on the right, America Cube Spinnaker is still collapsed. I mean, this isn't the first time they've been sailing, doing these maneuvers, and they've now had five bad dives in a row. Second mark, that's the bottom mark. We're on the run, the spinnakers are out, but now the spinnaker comes down. The jib goes back up. Italy, they were ahead by 33 seconds at the top mark. They will maintain a slight advantage around the bottom mark. We go back to windward for the third time. Third leg, second time we go back to windward. As Il Moro goes around here, American Cube looks very late on the fore deck getting their sails ready for the rounding. Il Moro definitely sailing with a lot more speed now. So it was 33 seconds at the top mark, 32 at the bottom mark. We go back to windward. Having a lot of trouble getting that spinnaker in, too, as they go around the mark. From behind the judge's boat. The boat that said green flag, no foul after the protest flag flown at the back of ITA 25, the Red Hulled Italian boat. Hold on, let's come down. Let's see if we can pick up conclusive evidence or not. This is the spinnaker. Did it touch? Memorial being the lured boat has the right of way. Amer American Cube's got to stay clear. And based on that picture, Jim, we did not see any collision. Robert Hopkins with a protest flag. It was green flag by the on-the-water judges. No foul. So we're on the third leg. We go back to Windward for the second time. Italy, they're ahead at both marks, one and two. They're trying to even up this series one all. Citizen ProMaster. ESPN's live coverage of America's Cup 92, Race 2, is being brought to you by the Prudential, rock solid in real estate. By AT&T, proud sponsor of the 1992 America's Cup. And by Canon, the number one copier company and the new power in high volume copying. One thirty out west, four thirty back east. Wherever you are, welcome this Mother's Day. Il Moro, ITA twenty five, the challenging boat ahead of the defense. That's America Cube by thirty two seconds around mark number two. On board, the men of El Moro di Venezia, the grinders working away. Danielle Bresciano and Massimo Gali, David Tizzano and Francesco Rapetti. We go back to windward for the second time. And in the rear view mirror, you can see Buddy Melgus tacking away. Now we're on board America Cube. 
And their grinders today, Marty Steppen, the ex -foot or the football coach. John Huffnagel, he sailed with Dennis Connor back in 83 aboard Liberty. The only member of either crew to have America's Cup experience in race one yesterday. Jim, as you look at the boats, you'll notice that the sails are different color. That's because the fabric is different. The Oro using Kevlar, the brown cloth. American Cube using a liquid crystal fabric. That's why it's silver. Much different. Let's check our ESPN sail track, courtesy of Trimble Navigation and Silicon Graphics. We go back to windward. Now you notice that Omoro on the left packs directly between America Cube and the Breeze. Classic match racing move in his covering, and that's exactly what they're doing. America Cube on the right tacking again. Omoro on the left following suit. They're not going to let him go. This will be a good test to see which boat maneuvers best at full speed when sailing to windward. Every time you turn the boat, you analyze whether you've gained or lost compared to the other competitor. If you've lost, you turn slower or faster, but you adjust the rate of turn. And that's what Hopkins and Dellenbaugh are telling our helmsmen how they're doing. Paul Kerr playing it by the books, trying to stay directly upwind of America Q. Now, if America Cube starts gaining, KR will break off the tacking duel and sail in a straight line, try to stretch it out. It's always tempting when you're in KR's position to extend, continue for a little bit longer to get more accelerated. But if he does that, he risks letting America Cube gain some separation and maybe benefit from a wind shift. This is where Dennis Connor was so good throughout the trials, balancing between covering and playing the wind shifts. Of course, the skipper, the navigator, the tactician, all looking for puffs of wind, little dark puffs out on the ocean, anticipating. Let's take a look at more. Here's Peter Eisler. No boat can sail directly towards the wind. They must tack back and forth, always sailing as close to the wind as possible, about a 45 degree angle. The wind is rarely constant, so sailors must alter their course to compensate for the shifts. As the wind moves to the right, the boat can turn to the right, keeping a constant angle with the new wind. As it shifts to the left, the skipper must turn left. Note the track of the boat as it reacts to these shifts. On the race course, we sometimes see the boats sailing in opposite directions. As they get farther apart, the effect of any shift grows. Sailing upwind is like climbing a ladder, with the rungs aligned perpendicular to the current wind direction. Here, two boats start even, on the same rung. They sail apart for some time, and then tack. But if the wind remains steady, when they come together, they'll still... ...sailed a flawless race, a Dennis, Dennis Conner race, if you will, as far as picking up the various wind shifts. It's always a tricky balance, and here, America Cube on the right, just tacking every time a war on the left. Uh, tacks on him. There goes America Cube tacking away. And I think America Cube catching up. How's it look to your position, Peter? Maybe just slightly, Gary. We thought it was pretty even, but in that last exchange, America Cube did close some. It appears that Kayard wants to protect the right side of the course. He tacked right on America Cube, forcing them to the left. So he must expect the wind to continue to shift to the right. It's already gone 15 degrees to the right today. I notice that Kayard is now standing and steering, which has been his practice throughout the trials. First leg, he sat down for the first time. I think having Mr. Gardini on board as the 17th man has had a calming effect on Paul today. Good inspiration. That was a pretty aggressive move down there by the bottom mark. On split tacks. Del Moro with the red hull on port tack. Wind coming over the left side of the boat. Buddy Melgus and the white hull boat, the defender boat, representing the San Diego Yacht Club on starboard tack. Wind coming over the right side. KR tacks over to starboard, so both boats are back in phase. Italy ahead by 33 seconds at the first mark, 32 seconds at the bottom mark.
Mr. Gardini. He's poured through a lot of lira, whatever it takes, the reported budget. He built five boats. This is number five off the assembly line, challenging for the America's Cup. Bill Koch and the men from America Cube trying to keep it at the San Diego Yacht Club. The 92 edition of the Merchant of Venice, Mr. Gardini. And his red hauled boat continues to speed away upwind, Peter Eisler, on this third leg. Paul Kerr, has got his lucky hat. He's got his lucky owner on board today. Mr. Gardini, he wasn't on yesterday. Get on board today, and they're in the lead. One day he wore a Yankee, New York Yankees baseball cap. Kerr has done what Gary's talking about. Just he's opted to play the shifts right now. It's not really covering America Cube tightly. You can see both boats on opposite tacks. Kerr thinks he and the Kiefi brothers have the wind shifts figured out, so he's trying to gain by the wind shifts. In spite of covering by the wind shifts, playing the wind shifts, I think uh, America Cube's going quite fast here and is definitely catching up. Remember, they've had a lot of problems, crew work problems, jiving, rounding the last mark, maybe 10 boat lengths behind at that point, yet here they are only five boat lengths behind. It shows that this boat is pretty fast. Coke working the coffee grinder over on the port side, dressed in all white. As the crew also comes over, shifts their weight. Another cross coming. Now, when you're attacking duel like this and you're on America Cube on the right, and every time you cross, if you notice that you're 10 feet closer, inching up, it gives a real good psychological boost to the entire crew. It makes you work a little bit harder, and it takes the breath away a little bit from the Italians knowing that the other boat is catching up. Looking back is Buddy Melgus tax again on USA 23. Kerr's goal right now is to try to force Buddy to make one or two extra tax using his advantage of being ahead. He'll try to force Buddy to make those extra turns before the top mark. 16 tax by these two boats thus far. Take a look as we go upwind. They're getting off to the right side of the course here, so not, not too much more time here. They'll get out in this direction and tack over and be in a direct course for the mark. This is what's called the lay line. So time running out for America Cube. Based on what we see here, American Cube only four boat lengths behind. This race is far from over. This white boat is fast. When we go back to mark number three, then we start the first of three reaching legs, the Z leg portion of our race course. Then the button hook turn back to windward, then the downwind finish. And based on another day of post quarter racing, this will be a very dramatic finish. These boats very even in boat speed. Notice, Jim, as America Cube just made that turn, that Buddy Melg is now turning the boat much slower, so he settled the thing down, and Dave Dellenbau has been a big help coaching him on the rate of turn, and as a result, they're doing better. Well, we first met our friend Chris Dixon when he jumped onto the scene in Fremantle, Western Australia with Kiwi Magic, the Plastic Fantastic. He's back alongside now. He, of course, sailed with Nippon, so we should say kon konnichiwa and yokoso. Thank you very much, Jim. Your Japanese is getting good. What uh, have you learned watching El Moro now? I'm very impressed with the way Paul Kayad is sailing today. He is up against a boat that is a little bit quicker. The America Cube boat looks faster upwind to me. It looks faster downwind. It even looks faster tacking. So Kayad is having to control by tactics, and that's not easy to do. Why do the Cubans look faster to you on almost all points of sail now? Well, they've got a good program, some good people, they've done a lot of development, and they've just got a good boat. And in the conditions we've seen so far, 
America Cube looks good. You were just fed up with the spying tactics of Bill Koch. I mean, that spy boat Gazzini out there, I mean, you were ready to send over the Japanese Navy and sink that boat, weren't you? It was a little disappointing to see that happening, but this is maybe part of the result, that when you're out there looking at what all your competitors are doing, you get the opportunity to take all the good ideas and put them into your own boat, and maybe that's what we're seeing in this America Cube boat today. You have always been fiery and aggressive, Chris Dixon, during the pre-start, during the racing. What about Paul Kayard yesterday, a costly error, but then Dennis made a costly error, and so did Dellenbaum. I mean, we're seeing very aggressive tactics in these new boats. It's high pressure out there. It's very tough to get past out a boat in front out there. There aren't many passing lanes. Winning the start, getting that first wind shift is very, very important. And both the starting helms and the skippers out there are very aware that they have to get a good start. And Kayard yesterday may be a little nervous, race one, jump the gun, and uh, it's, it's pressure. I know it didn't surprise you when Michael Fay and Peter Blake bumped Rod Davis from the boat and put Russell Coots on for the two races. You say that Michael Fay kind of encourages that kind of thing, but you have to feel a little bit vindicated, don't you? Well, it's, it doesn't really concern me that much. It, uh, I know what that camp's about. I didn't want to be part of it. And the, what we saw at the end with the skipper, the tactician, being bumped off the boat at the most critical time for them is just something that didn't look to me like the right thing to do. And I'm just thrilled that it wasn't me being bumped off. And uh, I feel for Rod Davis. I thought he handled it very, very well. Thank you, Chris. I know you've got a lot of match racing still to come with Russell Coots against Russell and against our friend Peter Eisler. We've got the mark rounding coming up. Stick around, watch some good racing with us. The red hulled boat, the challenging boat. The white hull belongs to the defender. Peter, how far to the mark? Jim, they have about another minute and a half, two minutes before the mark rounding. And this final attack by Omoro on top of American Cube will probably be their last. Now American Cube pays. They must do two extra attacks before they round the top mark. Peter, I think American Cube should be very encouraged to have caught up this close at this point. They're always sailing into bad wind of El Moro. Here they're going to make extra tacks, and yet they're only going to be about three to four boat lengths behind. Good job by the U.S. team. I think Chris Dixon's point was well taken. Kayard doesn't seem to have a lot of extra boat speed today, except that one time after the slam dunk on the first leg. Yet look at the lead that he has. Good sailing by the Italians. Do you notice that the wind's going down from your position, Peter? It's maybe dropped about one knot, but it stayed fairly steady in velocity, Gary. It's one of those type of days where you don't really expect to see it change very much. Mark number three, Italy again ahead by 33 seconds at the first mark, 32 the delta at mark number two after the run with a spinnaker out. Back to windward we have gone now on leg number three. Then we start the first of three reaching legs. Notice the boats are on very different courses there. That's because American Cube trying to accelerate after the attack. And the way you accelerate is you sail away from the wind and lose your sails out at the same time. That running black stay block, that kind of round shape is what hit Bill Koch in the head yesterday. You notice Bill's kind of taking it up and making sure it's in the right position for the maneuver. He doesn't want to get clunked again. Citizen Watch on El Moro again. So an ocean and a continent away. You can hear some loud cheers going up over that nation of Italy. This is the first time their boat has done anything like this in an America's Cup final. First time they've been in the finals. And this white boat led at every mark yesterday. So they did knock off, Peter, 12 precious seconds on that last beat to windward. Very impressive. America Cube was going faster. We saw Elmora was faster on the reaching legs yesterday. It'll be interesting to see if that same situation holds true today. So we're on the first of three reaching legs now, the Z-leg portion of our eight-leg New America's Cup race course. And we've got a new leader again today. Yesterday, it was America cubed wire to wire. Paul Kayar trying to do the same thing and even up the series at one race apiece. One of the most beautiful natural harbors in the world is home to a world-class convention center, 200 acres of bustling marine terminals, 
250 acres of waterfront parkland, 15 miles of bayfront bike paths, 5,100 hotel rooms, 60 restaurants, 13 boat repair yards, 7,800 boat slips, the busiest cruise ship port in California, the 25th busiest airport in the country, and the America's Cup. The Port of San Diego. Discover what's in it for you. ITA 25, El Moro Di Venezia against the men of America Cubed on Mother's Day. Race 2. Pictures from Blimp Cam, if you will. These aerial pictures, courtesy of Goodyear's newly painted and renamed airship Eagle. The Eagle reflects Goodyear's tradition of naming its blimps after former winners or contenders of the America's Cup. It was Rod Davis who came with Eagle back in 1987. Jerry Kirby was part of that syndicate back then. He's the bowman on America Cube today, part of the Spectator fleet. Watching the Cubans trying to make it a 2-0 America lead, or Italy even up this series at one race all. From Point Loma, ESP in your face. And from on board, the Italian boat. Mr. Gardini there, along with Paul Kayard. Very impressive gain of 12 seconds by the Cubans on that man, and Robert Hopkins and the Italian crew. The margin down to 20 seconds around mark number three. The first of three reaching legs and a difference in sails, Gary. Well, Jim, uh, tomorrow, as they go down the fourth leg here, is sailing with uh, two sails right now, while America Cube is sailing with three. You can just see it on the bottom of the screen. They have what's called a staysail. It's a small sail in between the spinnaker, the jenniker, and the mainsail to try and get a little extra speed. They know from testing that winds of 8 to 9 knots like we have right now, that that third sail seems to work, and yet El Moro is not using that sail, so we'll see the time differential to see if that sail worked. Peter, this is, of course, called a, a broad reach as opposed to a close reach. What's the difference? Well, the difference is the wind direction, Jim. Right now, the wind coming from the right side of the boat, but aft of the beam, in other words, behind the boat, the, about 130 degrees from the boat's course. When they turn and sail on this next leg, the wind will be mu from much farther forward. And they'll have to put up different sails to account for that. Broad reach, the wind from broad from behind. Tight reach, the wind more close ahead. And reaching certainly the fastest point of sailing because the wind is coming directly across the side or perpendicular to the boat. Well, it looks like uh, American Cube hanging right in here on this leg. Maybe that staysail, the third sail, is working well. Looks like the Cubans actually, Gary, have picked up about a half a boat length. If you notice El Moro's sail on the left, the front part of it seems to have a different color cloth in the back edge, and that's because the weight of the sail, the weight of the fabric is heavier. That's a pretty expensive spotter there, one of Europe's most wealthiest men, Mr. Gardini, watching the white boat. Coming back, always wears a tie when he's on board. Would love to take the America's Cup to Venice. And if he is successful in doing so, made an interesting statement, said that he would like to defend the Cup as Europeans, not as Italians. He would like to defend without having to use passports. Certainly the trend in Europe these days. Well, as they go around the fourth mark, the difference could well be in sail handling. America Cube earlier in this race having trouble jiving the spinnaker. They'll have to take the jenniker down and haul another sail up. Good chance to gain or lose distance. You can see the difference in color of the sailcloth there. And that's because the weight of the cloth is different. It ranges from three-quarter ounces per square yard to a half ounce per square yard. We've shown you blimp cam. How about scuba cam? That is a live picture from below mark number four. There is the actual mark. And we have a diver in the water with scuba cam, all right? We will watch this fourth mark rounding from water level. First time this has been done in America's Cup history. The boats at our diver, it'll be the last time, too. 
Peter, it looks like the Cubans are keep, keep whittling away there. I think they've climbed to within about two boat lengths, two and a half maybe. You know, it's interesting because of the current is sho shoving them from the right side of the screen towards the left. This leg is a broader reach than it started out to be. In other words, the wind's more from dead behind the boat. We've already seen the advantage that America Cube has when the wind comes from behind. When you're Paul Kayard and you're leading like this and the other boat keeps catching up, well that, that pressure and tension builds all day. He trained against the Kiwis, so he knows what tight racing is all about. Fourth mark, the wing mark, coming into view. When they hit that mark down will come the spinnakers, the jennikers. They will jive, and they'll set the headsail. And the choice of the headsail on that fifth leg will be very crucial, won't it, Gary? Yesterday, that choice, I think, hurt Omar a little bit. They elected to go with a smaller sail than America Cube. In fact, much smaller. And as a result, they lost nine seconds on that leg. Here we are on sail track, heading down this fourth leg here. American Cube following directly behind Paul Kaird as they go around the mark. It's going to be fascinating to see our scuba cam. The, mark, the camera is actually inside the mark, inside the course, so the buoy will be between us and the boats as they pass by. There's a new sail getting ready to go up. I bet we see a bigger sail today than we saw yesterday. Yesterday, the Italians hoisted a fractional headsail and the staysail. There's Mark IV, and we'll watch that Mark rounding with scuba cam. Sound coming from Italy. Absolutely no doubt, America Cube get catching up. The great Fontini, Alberto Fontini is the bowman, Andrea Morani is the mash man. from scuba cam, the first mark rounding from water level. The surprise here, Jim, they're going with the small sail. Again, the delta at mark three was 20 seconds. Let's see how America Cube did. I think they've shaved a couple of seconds off that. Americans going with a bigger sail. Again from scuba cam, water level, a diver in the water as America Cube rounds the wing mark. So we're back on the fifth leg, the fastest point of sail. Fordick working feverishly there. Very different sails being set by these two boats. America Cube has a big Jenniker, it goes all the way to the top of the mast. About 3,000 square feet of sail area. The Italian boat, Jim, on the right, has a much smaller sail. Look at the difference in size of these sails. We're going to learn a lot right here. Puzzling, Gary, because they set the same sail combinations yesterday, and American Cube gained something like 11 or 12 seconds on this reaching leg. Yesterday, they gained, the Cubans did nine seconds on this fifth leg. The margin at the fifth mark yesterday was 5.050 seconds. Italy's lead reduced by two ticks around mark number four. synonymous with this event for two and a half decades said the America's Cup has been going strong for 142 years and has proved once again that it can overcome any problems and emerge as a premier sporting event in the world. It has never been healthier and it has a big future whether the United States wins or it should go to Italy. Right now race two is going to Italy by 18 seconds around the wing mark mark number four. We're on a close reach the fifth leg the fastest point of sale. Peter, what's been happening? 
But right now it appears that Omora has tried to sail up in front of America Cube a little bit to try to give them bad air. They're locked in right here. Not much gain by either boat. Jim, notice that the sails are very different. Notice that the Italian sail only comes up about seven-eighths of the way up the mast, while America Cube sail goes all the way up to the top. A very different philosophy in the sails here. Yesterday, the Italian boat losing distance because of the smaller sail, yet they keep sailing with it. Look how small the sail is compared to the mainsail. Now, they've learned in their testing that this sail seems to work best racing against the Challengers. On the other hand, the American boat has learned that the bigger sail has worked best. And I'm willing to bet that for the next time we're in the race, whoever gains on this leg will show up. Maybe next time we'll see the Italians with a bigger sail and Americans with a smaller sail. This sail that you're looking at on America Cube is a design actually developed by uh, Dennis Connor and uh, Tom Wynn at North Sails. And uh, Star uh, Stars and Stripes lent a few sails to America Cube in the past seven days. And this was one of the sails that America Cube thought was quite fast in their testing, and they're using that shape. In front of the big power boat. Most of the sails aboard America Cube, developed by Saab said Chesapeake, your friend Larry Leonard. Larry's done a very nice job and is the man responsible for building the Cuban fiber sails that we've seen so often here. Buddy Melgus, I'd like to do, for you to do this rounding on the next leg. So you tell me when you want to step on the helm, okay? There's no uh, sail for the next leg. What? I will. look at the two boats it looks like oh, Oboro is stretched out a little bit here same sail I think they're actually giving some dirty wind actually blocking a little bit of the wind of the going on in the sails of American Cube okay wait sorry tell the came to take away the oldest trophy in sports, the Italians. Of course, we said so long to the Australians, the Spanish, the Swedes, the French, Nippon, the Kiwis. We're down to just one challenging for the Holy Grail of yachting. Let's take a look at the regatta. 163 races with Peter. The Challenger Trials featured intense competition between eight teams representing seven nations, the most countries ever to compete for the Cup. There were two classes of challengers, the low-budget effort, strapped for cash, and those with nearly unlimited funds to design and build multiple boats. The most remarkable challenge came from the former Soviet Union. A Russian hull made it to San Diego, but amidst confusion and a severe lack of funding, the boat never touched water. Sweden's entry was the prettiest boat in town, but lack of practice time doomed the shoestring effort. The friendly Swedish crew certainly scored high in party points. Australia sent two teams. Spirit was seen as a potential dark horse, but the talented team with their radical boat ended up a disappointment. Sid Fisher's Challenge Australia had a severe case of the slow boat blues. Of the four teams eliminated after three rounds, the first time entry from Spain did the best. They went home happy to have placed first amongst the consolation fleet, with plans to pursue a challenge in 95. Of the top four challengers, the Nippon Challenge was the biggest surprise for many. In Japan's first ever foray into the Cup Arena, they built three boats, hired Kiwi skipper Chris Dixon, and shocked the favorites by going undefeated in the third round, roaring into the semis in first place. But two major breakdowns in that round ended the Japanese dream abruptly. They finished fourth with only two wins in nine races. Their last victory, a sweet one against Domoro de Venezia. Veteran Marc Pajot and the French Challenge were looking to improve on their fourth place performance from 87. Many observers believe their boat was the fastest in San Diego. Erratic crew work and breakdowns plagued the team throughout the first three rounds. In the semis, Pajot started out fast, winning two of his first three races, but they won only two of the next six, ending their dream of representing France in the Cup. With the finalists set, New Zealand emerged as the clear favorite. Their boat was different, lighter weight, with a revolutionary tandem keel and controversial bowsprit. Rod Davis and crew started the best of nine finals fast, winning four of the first five races. They're only lost by a fraction of a second to Il Moro. 
Then everything went wrong for the Kiwis. Amidst controversy, Russell Coots replaced Davis. They lost the last two, dashing the hopes of an entire nation. Down 4-1, it seemed all but over for the Italians when skipper Paul Kerr dusted off his rule book and made a last-minute protest concerning the Kiwi bowsprit. Seeming to draw strength from the effort made in the protest room, the Italians sailed four straight near-perfect races to earn the challenging berth for the America's Cup. For Raul Gardini and Paul Payard, their victory was sweet, vindicating the immense investment by sponsor Montedison and sending Italy into its first-ever Cup final. Hold boat has ever won an America's Cup in the lead in race two, ITA 25. The men of El Moro di Venezia. 18 seconds, the delta around wing mark. That was mark number four, headed to the fifth mark. That'll be a right hand turn, the only right hand turn on the race course. You think Paul should have a bigger sail up, don't you? I really do. I think that the larger sail is faster. America Cube did not have a good turn around Mark IV. They lost distance there. But since that time, I think America Cube is catching up. And you can just see the difference in size of the sails here as they go down this leg. And that's got to make a difference in speed. Even our sail track has got a difference in the size of the sail. And the two boats head for the fifth mark here. center of your screen they call him proton he can bench press 325 pounds along with John Huffnagel right there he's the man that was aboard with Dennis Connor in Liberty back in 83 and the only man to have sailed in the America's Cup finals on either team notice the heel angle of the two boats you notice that America Cube behind seems to be tilted over. It's a little bit more top-heavy, and that's because of the bigger sail. There's more power in the sail, indicating that they probably have a little bit more speed. I bet you Paul's going to be glad to get around this mark and get a bigger sail up. The Italians have a sail off that's banned 24 hours a day. They have three shifts. So it would be no problem for them to build a sail like the Americans have right here and have it ready for Tuesday's race. You know, their sail loft is so busy, Gary, that they've had to farm out some work to the North Sales Loft here in San Diego that made all the sails for Stars and Stripes. America Cube reported to have made between 150 and 200 sales. Is that a conservative number? I think it is, Jim. I think they've made every bit of that, probably more. Some in Annapolis, Maryland. Some by Halsey Sailmakers in Connecticut. Fontini with a harness on. The crew members getting ready to take down the reaching headsail, jive, and then set the Jenniker back up for another broad reach on leg six. What they've got to do here, Jim, is take one sail down, the small sail that we've seen, and haul another sail up, which is much bigger in size because the wind direction is a little bit different to the angle of the boat that they're going to be steering on the next course. And this change is crucial. If you do it well, you gain distance. If you don't do it well, the other boat catches up and could even pass. And you heard Bill Koch a while ago say, buddy, get ready. I want you to do this turn for us and take the wheel. So let's see if Bill Koch Peter, can you see from your vantage point as Coke handed? Yep, it's Buddy back at the helm. But he's going to take the turn. As Gary pointed out, this is very tricky, and it's a combination of steering, sail trim, and foredeck work that makes it come off smoothly. The Italians have the new sail ready to go. It's already up. Seconds. The time around mark number five, the right-hand turn, Italy. Add 
added one precious second to their advantage after mark number four. Keep in mind in the Challenger Series that Peter just alluded to, we had two one-second races between the Kiwis and the Italians. So this is a very close race as Italy tries to square up the series at one race apiece. Buddy Melgus is back at the helm and over at Point Loma, the American Cute Bruder is saying, come on guys, catch up and lead this thing. Two races to none. 92. It would have lots of great race shots, revealing profiles of the competitors, the lowdown on high-tech design, and 141 years of cup history. All shot by the world's top yachting photographers with over 200 full-color pages. And if you order now, you'll also receive the official video of the America's Cup, both for just $49.95, the price of the book alone. So call 1-800-282-ESPN and order now. And our Goodyear Blimp Eagle, San Diego off way off in the horizon the spectator fleet there awaiting at mark number six this is the button hook turn a 180 degree turn and we go back to windward again for the third time on our eight legged america's cup course and then the downwind stretch drive to the finish winterbach part of the america cubed armada firewater their tender all the a3 supporters out there rooting this mother's day and a3 continuing just to inch up ever closer to paul kayard and italy Looking down at America Cube, A3, if you will, we call it Cuban cloth, Cuban fiber, and Cuban, C-U-B-E-N, is really the nickname that the uh, America Cube teammates gave to themselves, Gary, when you were part of the syndicate. That's how they've been affectionately referred to around town. It's kind of a strange name, the Cubans, but they're proud of that name, and it's kind of stuck, and we read about it every day in the papers out here, and it's what they call themselves. In fact, they even had a regatta recently amongst themselves, and they call it the Bay of Pigs Regatta. And the little compound they have there called the Bay of Pigs Yacht Club. And here's a picture of the Cuban fiber cloth developed specifically for this America's Cup, made out of liquid crystal polymetric carbon fiber fabric. Got a nice win, buddy. You just said a mouthful. Looks like it's a little more, too. Just up the street a ways, John Miller, Joe Morgan standing by, Toronto and California as they will do battle tonight. That'll be at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Toronto, 21 wins, 11 losses, trailing Baltimore in the American League East and the California Angels in Anaheim. They're in third place in the West. Who's pitching tonight, Gary? A couple of right-handers, Guzman and Grahey. How about those birds from Baltimore? They're really doing well in that new stadium this year. I'm sure after the Cup's over, we'll get some catch some Orioles games back at the new stadium they built at Camden Yards. It's fantastic. Man, America Cube is coming on. Gary, we talked a lot about the new America's Cup course. There are eight legs. The three reaching legs. Very seldom do you see any lead changes on the three reaching legs. Do you think this should be changed? I really do, Jim. I think even though you know, you're seeing a little excitement right at this moment, overall there's very little passing, if any, on the reach legs. We see a lot more action downwind. It'll be a lot less expensive, so you don't have to develop these sails. And I think the next cup, get rid of these three reaching legs. They don't mean anything. There's no passing. Right they there. simply don't work. Peter, you had a campaign going for a while, and you'd like to come back again, whether it's in San Diego or in Venice. What do you think of the eight-leg course? I like the course, all but the three reaching legs. Let's get rid of those reaches and just go up and down like every other match race. The reaches are boring. Yeah. Well, that was bluffing. He had the right to do that. Yeah. Of course, one thing is you look at some of the members of A3 there, Wally Henry out of Fort Jefferson, New York. Kirby, the former hockey player. There's Peter Craig, the masked man with the mustache. His dad watching in a hospital back in Massachusetts, recovering from surgery. There's John Huffnagel again, Andreas Josenhans on this Mother's Day. When the crew gets a chance to rest a little bit, except for Huffnagel there, it's a good chance to reflect and think, as Buddy Melgus was telling us not too many days ago. Reaching legs, a good opportunity to clear one's thoughts, clear the head, and get ready the for the tacking duel that we all expect on the next leg. It's a good time for me to, to settle out. Uh, 
begin to look a little bit more around at the wind and the weather and the water and, and uh, get a better feeling, wrap with by a little bit more about how we might want to uh, either protect or, or uh, go offensive on the, on the next uh, windward leg. Bill does a great job of steering those legs and, and uh, uh, it gives the whole team in the afterguard a chance to recommunicate what had taken place and, and what was good, what was bad, what we could do different. So it's a, it's a, it's a definite uh, good time. In fact, I did that in Australia quite a bit, but Bill Shore sailed the reaching legs and gave me an opportunity to, to uh, rebuild. From ice boats to the America's Cup, Buddy Melgus, Paul Kayart, from El Toro's when he was eight years old, to a Port Taylor for Tom Blackhall, to skipper for Raul Gardini. KR, the Port Taylor for Blackhaller's unsuccessful defense expert in 83. Who was the starboard Taylor? Mike Topa on America Q. The boats approach the bottom mark. The race committee signaling a course change, 170, so they say the wind shifted to the left 10 degrees. Well, this is going to be some exit away from this mark after they come around. America Cube will try tacking away, and KR will cover closely. We could have a lot of tacks here. This is the button hook turn, 180 degrees back to windward. Alberto Fontini there. Cubans have caught up, haven't they, Peter? Yes, they have, Jim. They've closed within about two and a half boat lengths right now. We could see a false tack here by America Cube trying to catch Omoro off guard after the mark. Conservative rounding here by Omoro taking the spinnaker down early. And scuba cam again. That diver is faster than the boats. <laughs> Seconds. It's still Buddy Melgus at the wheel. There he is on the port wheel. So they knocked six more seconds. This is going to be a great finish. Back to windward we go. A little slow tack by America Tube. They had trouble getting that Genoa sail in. I don't think the crew was actually prepared for the turn, Peter, when they started going. They might have waited a little longer. That gave them more of the chance to get their bow ahead, so they're still very much in control. The more look like they're already up to speed, while the American Cube's still struggling to accelerate. by 33 seconds at the top mark, by 32 seconds at the bottom mark. Then we hit the Z legs and the deltas went 18, 19, and then six more seconds shaved off by Buddy Melgus and America Q. Back to windward we go, separated by no more than a boat length and a half. Five miles to go in this race. Just a wall of faxes over at the office of El Moro di Venezia. <laughs> this event, bigger than the World Cup. Paul Kayart, he'll be more of a household name than Alberto Tamba by the time this is done. <laughs> is that a Team Dennis Connor logo I saw on one of those faxes there? No, it couldn't possibly be, Jim. Did that say good luck, Paul? And No, that... they're attacking. There go the men from Italy. Now, America Cube is in phase, and they're going to have to get out of phase. It's going to be, take some tricky maneuvering to be able to do this. And Buddy Melgus tacks right behind. You can see in the rearview mirror. There they go. Both boats pushing the sail track meter up over nine knots. We gained on that. This is when you don't want to be a grinder. 
using the grinder mentality, this is when you want to be a grinder. They love it when they get to get into a tackle duel. Particularly when you start catching up. This is the third beat to windward, if you will. You can see what Italy was able to do on the first leg. They were faster by 34 seconds. USA 23 faster on the third leg by 12 seconds. Jim, I think the record here in these cup trials has been 27 tacks on one of these legs. I bet you we break that record right now. You know, Paul Kaird has to be thinking right now. He saw his 34-second lead at the top mark. He had whittled away basically to nothing before he had that very aggressive move. Move. I think he needs about a 40 to 45-second lead at the top mark to hold off American Cube on the final run to the finish. America Cube is starting to gain here. They're just about out of phase. working together, coordinating the sail shape that makes the difference. Computerized color graphics, computer information, GPS off the boat. There's the tacking duel so far. So far, six tacks by both boats. Here comes the seven. American Cube's jib is filled. Italy is still packing. As soon as Italy's jib will fill, America Cube will start their tack back. There they go. Whoa, KR starts tacking directly on top. He's trying to get back in phase with the American boat. Notice America Cube tacking again and KR tacking again. The challenge for both boats now is to maintain good speed because that, every time they maneuver, they lose speed. Right now, they're only going about five knots. Full speed is about nine knots. And there goes Buddy Melgus again, tacking back to port. Kayard stays right with him. The key here is the rate of turn. If you turn too fast, you lose speed. If you turn too slow, you lose distance. The grinders there aboard ITA 25, Francesco Rapetti and David Tizano, Massimo Galli, Danielle Bresciano. 42 tacks on the first beat, 27 tacks the second time we went back to Windward. In a previous trials race. Both boats going very slow now, Jim. They're both under six knots, one about five knots. Just about 2.30 out here in the Pacific, 5.30 back east. If you're just joining us, you're on board ITA 25. They are behind, one race to none, best of seven. Boat on the right side of the screen, now tacking over to starboard. That is America Q. They won yesterday by half a minute. It's a best of seven for the America's Cup. Will the Cup go to Venice, where these men would like to take it? Or will it stay at the San Diego Yacht Club for another three years? We'll know in less than a week. And America Cube continuing to gain on this look. Look, only one boat length separating the two boats. This is great. And America Cube, you got to remember, is sailing in the back wind, the bad air or exhaust off El Moro. This one's going to be even closer. At some point, Kayard's going to break off the tacking duel. Because? Because he's losing too much distance, and he's going to try and stretch out and go for speed. Buddy Melgus is throwing everything at Kayard right now. And it seems to be working. This is a good test for those experimental sailcloth on American Cube. That Genoa has gone, hit the rig many times already. Every time the boat tacks, the Genoa gets a lot of pressure on the back end. I'll tell you, if you get a look 
look at sail track, it looks like a corkscrew right now. There have been so many tacks in this race. Just on this leg. Look at that. That's a corkscrew. 21 tacks each so far. 21 more, and they'll break the record in the trials of both challengers and defenders. At this rate, they're going to do it. I'm very impressed by America Cube's performance in this duel because they're sailing in the bad wind of Bill Morrow on every tack. And not only are they holding even, they seem to be gaining. It might have looked like that helicopter was very close to the boats, but those helicopters are at least 500 feet from the top of the mast. So as the tacking duel continues on this beat to windward, approaching leg number or on leg number seven, we'll come right back. From high overhead, back on board ITA 25. They were in front by only 13 seconds. Both boats breaking off the tacking duel, only one boat length apart. What we want to watch here, American Cube will probably tack again, but will they hesitate and go back on the original course for tack here? This is a maneuver called the false tack that can catch the Italians off guard. Notice that Kayard here driving the boat is on the leeward side. That's so he can steer the boat and watch the competition at the same time. He wants to be ready for the maneuver. Race conditions, course heading is 165, south, southeasterly at 7. Way down from yesterday's conditions when it blew between 10 and 13. Seas are not nearly as lumpy as they were yesterday. There goes Buddy swinging back over to starboard tack. I'm surprised that KR lets them go. They're now out of base. Why does that surprise you? Well, he was doing well there and in good position. After all those packs, now American Cube is off on their own. Hayard must like the right side of the course or feel he's on a big lift sailing close to the mark. Peter? That's exactly the case, uh, Gary. Hayard is on a lift. He's the wind direction well around to the left right now. So the tack much more favored than the starboard tack. The lift is a wind ship that allows the boat to sail closer upwind. anybody's just tuning in where have you been you've missed the best race we've had in a long time bill coke owner cole helmsman working the coffee grinders crew moving over over on the port side as you're looking at the men of el moro di venezia here is their plight if they lose this race they then would have to win four of the next five to win the America's Cup. America Cube, two of the next five. Of course, if it's all even, it comes down to a best of five. And the key here for America Cube is to keep it close because going downwind, they seem to have a little bit more of an edge on the second leg. So they've got that in mind. They don't want to lose too much distance on this tacking duel. Boy, talk about pressure. Pressure on both teams. And only one guy on both boats has ever been in the cup final before. Said he didn't look like he had any special pressure on the right. Now, Jim, if you notice, they've had a lot of tacks here. I think about 20, 21 in that area. And they're still deck three down one of the marks. So, Kayard is going to be working his way up, trying to reduce the number of tacks before rounding the mark and heading for the finish, which is 2.6 miles away. <laughs> on board here, Tommaso Chieffi said of Paul Kayard, we had the desire, we had the commitment, we had the technical support, but he was our leader, the modern day Christopher Columbus. Now the key question for Kayard is which side of the course does he think has more win, the right or the left? He's got to protect that side. He's also thinking they're not directly downwind of the mark, there's much longer sailing on port tack, about three times the distance than on starboard tack. So he's going to continue to hammer America Cube, forcing them to turn left, tack away, get out near that port tack ley line. 
And that was the closest cross we've seen, only about 30 feet separating the boats. America Q definitely catching up. Good job, guys. Nice work. Bill Cope. Buddy Melgas at the wheel. Of course, the most difficult thing in sailing is actually passing another boat. Back in phase, both boats on port tack. Wind coming over the left side. Paul Caird, of course, knows pressure. He was down three races to one to the Kiwis, and he knows what pressure is all about. He's the most experienced America's Cup on that team. No matter whether I'm racing my star or, or the America's Cup boat, the pressure that I put on myself exceeds the pressure that I feel from the outside. Let's say my own um, pride and ego really pushes me to not lose more than any outside pressure does. So um, yeah, while I feel responsible, let's say, to Mr. Gardini and Mont Edison and for the amount of money that we've um, consumed in this program, you know, that, that I'm, not overly, I'm not overly pressured by that. I mean, that's what it takes to do the America's Cup. Um, that's what it took for us to do the America's Cup this time. So that's, everybody's responsible for that. Um, but as far as success goes, I put um, enough pressure on myself that I don't have to worry about any outside pressure. You sailed with Paul Kayard. You sailed against him. You saw how relaxed he was last night, even after losing, after making a mistake that might have cost his team a chance to win. Paul really does well under pressure, and I think all the races against Chris Dixon and the uh, Kiwi team and the French has certainly helped him out here. He won't get fatigued. He'll thrive on it, but he knows he's got a real fight because America Cube is proving to be a little bit faster, both upwind and downwind. It's going to be very tough to hold him back before this finish. Thirty-two tacks so far for America Cube. Thirty-one tacks for the red boat that belongs to Mr. Gardini. Seven minutes to mark number seven. He knows that America Cube is faster going downwind, and 20 seconds isn't going to do it. He needs about 35 or 40 seconds to be comfortable on the last leg going to the finish. And that was the right tactical move there. Kaird goes in the same direction as America Cube, and he's hoping that he'll be able to tack on the wind of America Cube one more time before the top mark. Wind's looking a little bit lighter here from uh, our position. How about from your position, Peter? Yeah, Gary, it's about seven to eight knots, so it's dropped maybe two knots, three knots throughout the day, slowly decreasing. Which boat would that favor then, Peter, uh, in your mind, on the downwind finish? The white boat. right now. KR has got to tack directly on top of America Cube's breeze to push him back or make him make extra maneuvers. Save him a little gain, huh? Yeah. What? Yeah. starboard tactically aboard America cube what you want to do is minimize your loss because you know you are faster on the run Sorry. if they can stay within 30 seconds they should be able to pull this off how'd you like to be a grinder you think they're not having a tough day Peter Benley Rick Brent John Huffnagel there. And their counterparts, Danielle Bresciano, Massimo Galli, David Tizano, and Francesco Rapetti. Here comes America Cube again. So you, if you were Paul Caird, would be comfortable with about a 40-second lead around Mark 7, right? I think 40 seconds would be enough. Anything less than that, I think America Cube has a great shot at winning this race. Check our ESPN sail track A3 pushing the needle up at nine knots. And Jim, as you look at the two boats going up, look at all the tacks they had in the first third of the leg there, and then KR electing to stretch it out. American Cube, very impressive going through those maneuvers. 
saw that little corkscrew there in the early part of the leg. This third beat back to windward. 33 tacks now so far on this leg alone. And the last tack by America Cube may have been the most costly one on this leg. They tacked when they weren't up to full speed. They were in an area of light wind, and they've lost about three boat lengths in the last 30, 40 seconds. One of the indications whether Kayard is getting tense or not are her hand, his hands on the wheel. Now, Kayard has elected to tack below the ley line. From your eye, Peter, do you think he's going to be able to fetch the mark? He looks a little low to me. Gary, I think uh, he's counting on a bit of favorable current, which is still out here, to help push him up up to the ley line. So I believe he'll be okay. Fetching, as Gary referred to it, when a boat's course allows it to round a mark without tacking. As I mentioned earlier, when we see Paul Kerr from time to time, look at his hand. If it's gripping the wheel tightly, it shows he's got nervousness and tension. If his hands are open, he's very relaxed and calm. Right now, open hands. He's comfortable with the way he's going. Kerr may just have gotten the lead that he needs to protect when going downwind against the faster American Cube by those last two tacks. Of course, they're going to be going against the current toward the finish. That, in effect, makes the leg longer. That'll be an advantage to America Q. Yesterday, Italy dropped that pole in the water. right there as they're heading for the finish now lost 18 very precious seconds Italy doubled their advantage almost tripled it 31 is the Delta around the final mark so we have two and three-quarter nautical miles to go in race two can the red boat hang on and even up the series one race all or can a three come from behind and take a 2-0 lead we'll find out so don't go away Pacific with scuba cam. And right now, Paul Caird and ITA 25, 31 second lead. Is that enough, Gary Jobson? Very close. It's going to be very difficult. And I would think that jiving maneuvers down by the finish line will spell the difference. Both boats using a Jenniker, indicating that the wind is lighter. There's a tough sails to maneuver with to jive with. Peter Eisler, good call. The crucial moment on that seventh leg when Buddy Melga's tacked in. A3 was not up to full speed. Wasn't it? The last time they converged is about a boat length and a quarter difference when they came back that last time over three lengths. So Kayard got some breathing room that he needs right now. We have gone around that seventh mark. 31 seconds, the delta there. This is a downwind finish. Certainly a big difference from what we saw back in Fremantle in Western Australia. This is brand new. You can see a lot of lead changes here. And twice, Jim, we've seen one-second finishes with Bill Morrow going against the Kiwis. When we go downwind, as we are right now, the yacht that is astern has the advantage. How come? The trailing boat, American Cube, can block the wind of the leading boat, Bill Morrow de Venezia. That's what they're working for, is to get into position to be able to make some blocks and catch up. getting a radar gun that black box he's got in his hand sends out a signal a laser beam at the other boat bounces it back and you can tell within one foot how close you are to the other boat so you can tell okay, if you're gaining or losing feet on him in the last three minutes it's about 75 feet long so a 30-foot gain as bill indicated 
means that they've gained almost a half a vote line. Robert Hopkins with a radar gun. He took the blame yesterday for misjudging the current. Paul Kayard up front said it was his fault, Kayard, that they misjudged the start line. Admitted that for the last 20 seconds, he wasn't even looking at the pin end of the line where the buoy was. So we are downwind. We are on the run with the spinnakers out and A3 trying to catch up. Don't forget, coming up right after the America's Cup, the Indy Time Trials. Team Dennis Connor has a car there. And then baseball tonight. That'll be California and Toronto from Anaheim. I'm Gary Jobson and my daughter Christy and I are here to invite you to Discover Sailing. It's easy. Just call for a free introductory sail and discover the excitement. Thanks to U.S. Sailing, you'll love the adventure. Covering the America's Cup is more than tradition for Goodyear blimps. Two of their three blimps, the Eagle and the Stars and Stripes, were named after former America's Cup winners or contenders. From Blimp Camp, Point Loma, the Pacific, the venue for America's Cup 92. Will it be the venue for America's Cup 95? That is the question. Will Yachting's Holy Grail stay at the San Diego Yacht Club? Or will we all be learning Italian and headed off to Venice? We're on leg eight, the final leg. El Moro holding on. And Peter Eisler to your eye with the wind backing off just a little bit. We're kind of in the uh, Jenniker range, if you will. And I think maybe the red boat can hold on. Interesting, Jim. You know, we saw with the spinnaker up when the wind was up to 10, 11 knots on the first downwind leg. America Cube was much faster than Omoro. Right now, Omoro seems to be able to hold off America Cube slightly better now with the wind down about seven knots. Right now, we're about one third of the way down toward the finish line. When we get about halfway, America Cube will start making a lot of jiving maneuvers. And the sail handling, shifting the sail from one side to the other, could spell the difference in this race. I see good pressure right here over your right shoulder. A couple of dates to mark down. Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, races three and four. What, uh, what is William doing? What he's looking at is a little tube that goes... It's a little computer. He's getting some numbers there to see how the boat's performing. Kind of it was like a reverse here. version of a periscope. I saw somebody in an airplane do that one time, and they were looking to see if the landing gear had locked. A little bit of a secret weapon. Raul Gardini always wears that tie. Said he was born with a tie. It's like his sense of humor. He skied in a tie, sails in a tie. Said it's the most comfortable thing around his neck. Paul Caird would have a noose around his neck if he were to lose this race and fall behind two races to none. You know, Caird's done a very good thing here, positioning his boat below the track of American Cube. So he's in very little danger of being blanketed by the wind of American Cube if the other boat jives. Italy, they blew the start yesterday. It cost them 30 seconds. That was ironically the delta, the difference at the end. They fell behind one race to none. Paul Kayard said it would be hard for us to have a worse day than we had yesterday. But we've been trained to race from this position, and we will have race three for you. That's coming up Tuesday at 3 o'clock Eastern time, noon out here on the West Coast, with a series that apparently will be all even one race apiece. ESPN's live coverage of America's Cup 92. Race 2 is being brought to you by the Chrysler Corporation and its divisions, proud sponsors of the 1992 U.S. Olympic team. By Intel, the computer inside. And by Budweiser, the king of beers, with that clean, crisp, cold taste, nothing beats a bud. coming up next the Indy 500 time trials at the end of race number two again team Dennis Connor has a car there Dennis is headed off to Indianapolis about the 16th of May 
We are back live on the eighth leg. The red hold boat, the challenging boat, the white hold boat belongs to America Cube. Peter, we saw a jibe. How come? Well, finally, uh, America Cube initiated that. They turned over. They're getting close to the ley line, although there is still some more jive sailing to be done on both jobs. But O'Moro had a better jive, and they gained in the exchange. Let's check our ESPN sail track. Both boats going about eight and a quarter knots. You can notice that the boats are heading in this direction here. They'll have to sail out to this direction and then jive to head for the finish line. And I would say that when we get in this area, you'll find a lot of jiving going on. Just like we had tacks in that area going upwind, we'll have jives going downwind. And that sail handling, changing sails from one side of the boat to the other, could well spell the difference in this race. But I think America Cube's going pretty fast right now. Roll down with the pressure, please. Once again, KR sailing a lower track than America Cube. Good tactical move. He wants to protect his clear wind on both jives. Looks like Buddy's getting ready for a jive. The key here is who gets their spinnaker. The forward sail filled first. Just about the same time. Maybe a slight edge by a second to the Italians. Top of the hour here in the Pacific and back east from the Brickyard in Indianapolis. The Indy 500 time trial. That'll be coming up right after our America's Cup race number two is over. Got good pressure here. Gardini on board. It's his syndicate. He built five boats. Bill Coke built four. They have spent millions. Mega millions. Hayard stays right with Buddy. Peter, to your eye, either side having an advantage as they continue to jive? Well, until that last exchange, Jim, I thought Omoro was having the better jives, but this last one, America Cube had a nice turn going into it. And a gain for America Cube. Keep in mind that America Cube gets to select the time of the turn, and Omoro's got to react. The two boats are about 1.2 miles now from the finish line on this 2.66 mile leg. So about 60% of the leg is done. Coming out of the jive, though, Amoro had a better acceleration. They gained once again. So it appears in the jiving duel with the Jenniker up, Amoro has the edge. Let's check our ESPN sail track 3D variety. Well, as you can see, Jim, there's a lot of jiving going on here. And notice the alteration, of course. You can see the turns in the lines that they're steering, and that's a reaction to the change in the wind. Yet another jive here by the Italian. The key is the rate of turn of the boat and getting its Jenniker to fill with the breeze, so you accelerate for speed again. Peter, is A3 catching up to your eye at all? They may have caught up another 10 feet or so, Jim, but what KR is doing very well is in the second half of his turn in the jive, he's turning very slowly, and Buddy turns much faster in the, at the conclusion of the jive. I think that helps Omoro's spinnaker, Jenniker, fills quicker. As they get down toward the finish line, I think there'll be less wind because there's so many spectator boats there stealing the wind. The breeze on the water kind of goes up over the spectator fleet. And that could make it a little bit more difficult handling these sails. Bit of a problem, it looks like, on the lower corner of America Cube's Jenniker. looks like a small tear in it. Of which boat, Peter? Uh, America Cube. Where, where is a third of the way back from the uh, front corner of the sail along the bottom edge. There it is. Jerry Kirby up.
up there. So they will have to make a change. A tear like that in that position is not that dangerous. The higher the tear, the more dangerous it is. Down here, they could survive, but if it starts going, they got to get another one on deck. That time had to drop their halyard, the rope that holds the sail up, down some so they can clear the sail in the rigging. They're having trouble with driving this Jennifer. And you can see the tear there. It's a, about a one-foot square hole. And if it gets going, it'll just go right across, and they won't be able to use that sail. Nice time to jive by Buddy there. I think he'll gain on this exchange. Cameron was very slow when he started his maneuver. Paul's got to be careful not to react too fast to the jive. If his crew's not prepared, it could be disastrous. All American Cube has to do is block Omoro's wing right once, and he'll go right by. Peter Craig, the last man there. So far, the tear is holding just about a foot and a half square. And American Cube has a lot more speed than Omoro right now. Very good work. Moro's going to have trouble accelerating there because of the bad wind, the exhaust coming off the sail of America Q. Look, you're almost rolling it. Bill Coke saying to Buddy, you're almost rolling it. That means going over the top. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm more excited than you are. Now, right now, the wind of America Cube sails are going off in this direction, right at Il Moro, and Il Moro may have to jive away. If they jive first, it means an indication that they are in trouble. So Kayard is in a very tough position here because the wind is being blocked by the American boat. But he still has the lead. And as I mentioned earlier, the toughest thing in sailing is actually passing. Kayard can hang here, though. He's getting very close to the lay line, to the finish line. If he can hang here for another couple minutes, that will help his effort immensely. the most important of the entire race. That rip is not a dangerous area for a sail to have a tear. judges there. 40 minutes and 20 miles Sunday, it came down to this. It is Italy. America Cube won Saturday by 30 seconds. Sunday's slam dunk were the norm. Close quarters wouldn't even begin to describe it. The tightest America's Cup racing ever. And we saw a little bit of everything from spinnaker tears to four protests. But Paul Kayard persevered. At the end of 20 miles, the red boat in front by three seconds. Italy evens the series one all. They built four boats. This is the third generation. America Cube defending the old mug. Meanwhile, Mr. Gardini spent a lot of lira. Well over $100 million. Paul Kayard, how about a wave? They're ready for battle today. It's race three live. 
America Cube took the first race by 30 seconds. El Moro by three seconds on Sunday. It's now a best of five for Yachting's Holy Grail. As we welcome you back to... Until the very last, in which uh, uh, we were ahead, and we had a, uh, uh, a very bad jibe at the finish, and that allowed Paul to uh, sneak out ahead of us. Um, and I must say, Paul did a brilliant job. Looking back on it, after it's over, it was, it was a great race. It's a historic race. It's a, a race of all time. And I think we could have some more of those this week. And we've had a lot of them this spring. You know, this spring has been good America's Cup racing. Ironically, Paul Kayard was told by some TV guy, as Peter Eisler was called in the LA Times, that they had won. Even the two teams didn't know for a while. Well, the Cubans were out. They were practicing their jibing yesterday. The Italians were cutting more sails. What else did we learn after the first two races? Well, Jim, they can make minor improvements with their practice sessions, but these are the same two boats we've seen in the first two races. And going back and looking at those performance figures, we believe America Cubed is faster upwind by a couple of boat lengths, 10 seconds. But on the downwind legs, America Cubed has a huge advantage, about six boat lengths. So Paul Caird will have to use all of his wily tactics to stay ahead of the America Q boat. And speaking of those tactics, we saw just about everything that Buddy Melgus could have thrown at him. Kayard threw the kitchen sink and much more, and Paul Kayard came out on top. A great race, and everybody's talking about that luff on the second downwind leg. Omoro here to Leward turns hard right directly at America Cube. Now, Omoro had full right of way here, and Melgus steered out of the way. There was a protest flag. It was waved off. But the big advantage is Kayard's able to steer back down towards the mark, and Buddy Stuck pointed away from the mark. His boat stalled out, and Kayard gained about 25 seconds by that maneuver. Paul said, we've been trained to come from behind. They came from behind against the Kiwis. They were down three races to one. Earlier this morning, as the boats were towed out from San Diego Harbor, our Gary Jobson jumped on board with Mr. Kayard on El Moro, number five. Thanks, Jim. A relaxed mood aboard El Moro here. And, Paul, you've done some things to improve your downwind speed during the lay day. What have you done? Well, we've mostly worked on our sails, Gary, and uh, took a look at uh, three sails that we had uh, made uh, Monday night, Sunday night, and uh, they look pretty good. And uh, we feel, feel really comfortable about the position we're in and uh, looking forward to a good race today. How much speed can you gain? How many seconds per leg, for example? Well, it's, it's very interesting. Sails make a big difference to the boat speed, and uh, you can gain one or two-tenths of a knot, which may amount to something like 10 to 15 seconds on a leg. Uh, so it's, you know, two, two, th two to three boat lengths you can easily gain by having the right sail up. So uh, we just had to take a little harder look at what we had and make some improvements, and uh, that's been part of the game all spring long. It's just to keep improving, and there's no reason why that should stop this week. Now that you've had two races against America Cube, looking forward to best of five really now, how do you feel your chances are of winning three more? Very good. I've been in deeper holes, and uh, I think we have a very good chance of winning the America's Cup, and uh, today hopefully will be a good step. Whose weather window for today? The breeze blowing at 8 nine. Get the VCRs tuned up. Here it is. This America's Cup race report is sponsored by AT&T. During the pre-start maneuvers, both boats seemed a little more cautious during race number two. After all, Amoro skipper Paul Kayard did not want to risk jumping the gun like he did in race number one. The wind was steady at 9 to 10 knots, and as the boats approached the line, they were at opposite ends. America cubed at the bottom, favoring the left side of the course, and Omoro wanted the right at the committee boat end. It was an even start. The first wind shift would determine who had the lead. Winchester side, the big question in this race was boat speed. The two boats were even coming off the starting line. Bill Koch aboard America Cube studied his performance carefully and was satisfied with his boat's power. Paul Caird at the helm benefited from the starboard tack position and had the right of way as the boats converged. Buddy Melgas on port tack had to bear away and steer clear of Il Moro and starboard with the right of way. Il Moro then tacked to block America Cube's win and established a small lead. Approaching the top mark, Caird had sailed well, working a small advantage into three full boat lengths. This was the first time in Cup history that an Italian boat has been in the lead. In race number one, Elmora's crew had some trouble with their sail handling, but on this spinnaker set, Kayard had his team working to perfection. 
A 33-second advantage at the top mark was quickly erased. Like yesterday, America Cube was sailing much faster on this downwind leg. The hardest move to make in sailing is actually passing another boat. America Cube drew even with Bill Moro. Kayard, under the rules, was allowed to luff to prevent America Cube from passing and caught Melga's off guard. America Cube was almost stopped dead in the water, head to wind, while Amora was able to turn back towards the mark, gaining a big advantage while Melgus gained control of his boat. A protest by Amora alleging contact with America Cube's sail was waved off by the umpire. Green flag, no foul, keep racing. On the seventh leg, America Cube on the right was only one boat length behind after a long tacking duel. Melgus was sailing fast, and Kayard had trouble keeping the American boat back. But at the top mark, the margin had grown to 31 seconds, thanks to two costly last-minute tacks by America Q. On the run to the finish, with the wind behind, the sailing boat has the advantage because you can block the wind of the leader. Making their task more difficult, there was a rip in the Deniker, forcing America Q to jive with extra care. Then with just 50 feet to the finish, with both boats sailing directly downwind at low speed, it was anyone's race. Under the rules, the boat is considered finished when any part of the sail as a whole in their normal position crosses the line. You want to see it again? This was the closest finish in America's Cup history. The amazing thing really was how long it took the race committee to notify either team as far as the Italians winning and the uh, Cubans, if you will, losing. I mean, everybody was out there kind of wondering, waiting. So today it has been changed. The race committee has agreed, should we have another finish like that, they will immediately hoist the flag of the winning nation. Either the Italian flag goes up or the American flag, stars and stripes. Well, Jim, you made the call on Sunday, and that's how I was able to tell Paul Caird when I went on the boat. Looking back at the tape of the finish of the race, you can see from the aerial, we can't see the whole finish line, but the spinnaker of Omoro is actually the first object to cross the line. Now, there is some question whether that sail was in its normal position. Looking down from the waterline level shot, we can actually see the finish line and the orange flag on the committee boat. And with that, we'll be able to see that whether the spinnaker, as we see right now, it was flying out, was in position or not. In fact, the bow of the boat, and there we're just seeing the orange flag of the committee boat and the orange buoy. If the spinnaker's in its wrong position, the bow crossed first anyway. So America Cube dropped any thought of, ho of hoisting a protest flag. And there's no truth to the rumor that Mr. Gardini can go out there with an elegant European cigar and increase the length of the bow. All right, let's check in for our strafing run report. Here again is Gary. Well, Jim, all the design work and espionage that America Cube has been doing certainly paid off because clearly they have a very fast boat. And the problem for Paul Kayart is really similar to what Dennis Conner faced on Stars and Stripes. He's got to use clever tactics and strategy to be able to win these races. But the big difference here, I think, is that Oboro, at least, is a little closer to speed than uh, Stars and Stripes was. And as a result, this could be a series that could go easily six or seven races. And today, with the winds up and the seas down, Oboro could have her day. Just about 10 seconds away from the pre-start, ladies and gentlemen, the two boats entering from opposite ends of the arena. The pin end of the line at the bottom side of your screen. And at the top side, the committee boat end. Let's listen to Bill Koch count down. One, ten minutes. So we are underway in the pre-start. And given the evenness, Peter Eisler, of these two boats, this is probably the most critical point of the race. Absolutely, Tim. And we're going to see how aggressive Paul Kerr is at the start here. He knows he needs an advantage off the starting line in these moderate wind conditions. And they've been two very interesting pre-starts in the first two races. We're in. 9.30. from opposite sides at the nine minute mark. From on board, USA 23. Again, it's Dave Dellenbaugh handling things in the pre-start. Wind conditions, course heading 270 when we get underway. Winds are westerly up a full knot now, as Gary just said, at nine. Back on board. 
This is the Italian boat, Paul Caird in the white cap. Waves very smooth out here today, the smoothest we've seen in this series, in fact, in the last couple weeks. Gary, Paul Caird is one cool customer, isn't he? He really is. We were on board with him earlier, Jim, and he's very calm, cool, collected, and most importantly, confident. He really believes he could win this. Living in Venice now, in fact, he's been over there just about a month longer than his oldest child. He can detail his calendar and the history of the syndicate very well. The Chiappi brothers, Enrico and Tommaso, and Robert Hopkins, you know him very well. He was, of course, board Stars and Stripes, Peter, with you back in 87. That's right, and the Chiappi brothers and Hopkins took that time as the boat was sailing along there in a straight line to take a look up the course and try to figure out which side of the course holds more wind and a better advantage. Gary, any sign of that from your perspective? Well, I think the port side of the line is a little bit favored. And looking upwind, Peter, the wind very steady on both sides of the course. But about a mile up, they're going to get about two knots four breeze. So you, we may see some sail changes soon after the start. Boats now in aggressive clockwise circling. Neither boat has an advantage as long as they continue circling. TA-25 inside the seven-minute mark. What about the aggressiveness of Paul Kayard now? I mean, if you had to rate how Kayard was doing on a scale of one to ten, Peter, in the pre-starts in Dellenbaugh, give a number to each. Well, it's interesting, Jim. We've sort of seen two Paul Kayards and two Dave Dellenbaugh's in the first five minutes of the first race. You'd have to give Kayard ten and Dellenbaugh two. But then I think they've been pretty evenly matched up ever since then. Dellenbaugh's done a great job neutralizing the aggression of Kayard. I'm sure he worked on it yesterday and made it a pre-start practice against their tune-up starting helmsman, famous Harold Cudmore from Ireland. Oxbow Corporation lives in West Palm Beach, Florida. Oxbow up in the Boston area. Only been sailing eight years. Very successful, of course, with his Matador program and the Maxi campaign. Buddy Melgus, everything from scows to ice, ice boats. His second America's Cup campaign. Dellen Ball back as tactician. By Baldridge now appears to be very solid in the navigator spot. Billy Camber, Campbell. A very valuable job, said Bill Coke. The tune-up boat. Not a lot of glamour there. Billy very solid out of the U.S. Naval Academy. Gary, same question that I posed to Peter. If you had on a scale of 1 to 10 to give aggressiveness or a grade to Paul Kayard and Dellenbaugh, give me a grade for each. Well, Jim, I think uh, Kayard gets a 9 or a 10, Dellenbaugh a 4 or a 5. Although today, Kayard using a much different strategy. This is called a port pack stretch. It's oval-type turns trying to drag the boats away from the line. And uh, so far, uh, Kayard's making Dellenbaugh play his game using this technique. Peter, for the uninitiated, when you look overhead of those helicopter shots and from the blimp, all the pretzel-like maneuvers, how do you gain a favored position while you're turning it like this? So Jim, it's all respect to time and where the starting line is. As the boats are circling right now, they continually look at their watch right now. We're a bit under five minutes and trying to judge how far in straight line sailing time there is back to the line. The first boat to break off circling will initiate the lead back. And that should occur, Gary, it appears, and within the next 30 seconds. Neither boat really gaining an advantage so, so far, but they are about 2 minutes and 15 seconds away from the line right now. Interesting move there. American Chief packs over on top, so they go, instead of turning clockwise, they've turned to the left. And now both boats heading back to the line, El Moro leading back. Want to see what they've done in the last six and a half minutes? Let's check our ESPN sail track. Look at this pretzel on the water. That really shows what Gary's talking about, the port tack stretch. Notice how the boats continue to move in their circles towards the lower right, away from the line building speed when the wind's coming on the left side of the boat. Now somewhere there, they're headed back towards the line. One more important factor today is the current out here, about two-thirds of a knot, and it will be sweeping both boats to the right as you look at them down on the buoy end of the line. 
weren't very much a factor in race one when Kayard was over the line early. Robert Hopkins misjudged the current. Told Kayard the current was a half a knot when in fact it was a full knot. You're hearing audio coming from America Q. Bill Coke with the microphone counting down. camera angle there from the back end of El Moro. Inside of three minutes, start line, left side of the screen. Gary, with the current and the winds now to your eye, what's the better end of the line, the committee boat end or the pin end? Well, I like the buoy end right now, Jim. It looks good, and I like El Moro's position. Plus, there's more wind on the left side of the course about a mile away. That's Dave Dellenbaugh at the helm. Buddy will take over right at the start gun. The two bombmen working respectively, Alberto Fontini up on the red hulled boat. That's the challenging boat. The white held boat is the defender, Jerry Kirby, the veteran bombman, former hockey player, is up there. Thumbs up, thumbs down to the skipper. 220. Aaron in a great position here because he's still got a lot of distance to go before the left hand end, the buoy end of the line. Dillenbaugh can't afford to tack over yet. Dillenbaugh's goal is to push KR to get him early to the line and then tack away. Two minutes. KR still needs to kill about 45 seconds of time. 150. Having you up. in positions there. Now Kayard has let America Cube go around to the left side. He's slowing down trying to throw bad wind on America Cube's sail. Interesting, Gary. Kayard must like something on the right side. I'm kind of surprised by that move because he had the left pinned and we can clearly see more breeze on the left side of the course. Of course, both teams use men in helicopters looking at the course One before minute. the 10 minute gun to help communicate and try to guess which side will be favored. 55! Master beam there. That's right, Kaird was holding off the left signaling Master Beam. Now they've tacked apart. Diverging courses. God damn, I got hit again. Good luck, guys. I got hit. The other day, Bill Coke, who just alluded to getting smacked again, was hit by a running backstay block. Knocked a little bit groggy. They put some ice on. Maneuvering, trying to get up to full speed and hit the line at the gun. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, gun. No confrontation, a clean start. On starboard tack, the white boat, the defender, USA 23. Wind coming over the right on port tack, the red hold boat, the challenging boat, ITA 25. separate here, the effect of any wind shift will increase greatly. Buddy at the wheel, Buddy Melgus. Thank you. Good start, David. Okay. K.R. very relaxed at the wheel. Robert Hopkins in the shorts and the glasses out of Yale, the navigator. Surprised that they started Gary Jobson on split tack? I am, although America Cube has just tacked over to port, and that's an indication that they're confident in their position and that they are ahead at this moment by about a boat length. So both boats are in phase, three and a quarter nautical miles, the first leg, the beat to windward. America Cubed and Amoro Di Venezia, all even one race apiece. The tie will be broken in about three hours. Given the conditions today, Gary, which boat do you think should be favored? 
Well, the smooth seas, I think, is going to help the Moro out. The stronger wind helps America Cube. I think overall, America Cube right now looks to be the faster boat. this first beat to windward three and a quarter nautical miles this is a uh, with extra length and the entire eight leg course there the z leg the chicane then the button hook then we go back to windward for the third time and then a downwind finish 20 nautical miles start to finish averaging somewhere between two and a half and two hours and 40 minutes and of course on sunday if you missed it two hours and 40 minutes plus 20 miles on the race course these two boats separated by just three seconds at the conditions that we've had so far in the America's Cup. South winds, the wind much stronger in the first race. America's Cube won that when Elmore was over early. And in the second race, eight to 10 knots, about the wind range we have right now. Seems smoother today than either the first or second race. toward the left, and that is the advantage of America Cube. You can see that America Cube clearly sailing a higher course. So we're still making bearing on him. Well, if Dennis Conner is the Houdini of sailing, Bill Koch is rapidly emerging as the Red Baron. I'm going down, boys, but carry on without me. Kayard in the Maxi Boat program for many years, and obviously holds each in very high esteem. I should say this, I've raced against Paul uh, and Raul and the Italians, I guess, uh, four, five, six maxi series, uh, five, six years. Uh, I know them quite well. Uh, they've beaten us, we've beaten them. Um, they've crumbled under certain pressure, we've crumbled under certain pressure. Uh, so it's going to be a very interesting, in interesting match. Um, I must say, I have a lot of respect for him. He has been called Kardini, but the Italians call him that with affection. 32-year-old native of San Francisco, grew up in boats, raced lasers, El Toros, 505, snipes, fireballs, any dinghy you could find around the St. Francis Yacht Club. America Cube get the left side on the start, and two immediately after the start, when America tacked, the Cube tacked the cover, Kayard should have really started attacking duel right then. That's the shot from the back of the boat. That's exactly what the sailors see. They'll judge the size of America Cube's mass as it comes across into view on the right side of the force day. That'll be their gauge next time they come back together. Robert Hopkins using his laser rangefinder to monitor that distance accurately. Force day, Peter. Force day is the wire that holds up the mast in the front. It's also the wire that the jib sail is hoisted upon, the leading edge of the jib. sail track you can see those final tacks but the difference is the wind has shifted to the left here and the boats will sail a much longer course on the port tack the long tack they made here KR waited until the wind went to the right to make his convergence now they're going back tacking away well if it's a big lead already going to windward what about downwind look at that 30 seconds over the first two rakes 
you know, I think that number is very accurate, especially in the stronger winds when they get the spinnakers up. It looked like Omora was better in the lighter winds downwind, like the race on Sunday when they had their Jenniker sail up. America Cube's about 15 degrees from the starboard ley line now, so she could stretch out here a little bit. You look at all the money that America Cube has spent, somewhere between 65 and $70 million. They have built four boats. Mr. Gardini has constructed five. You look at Coke and Melgus and all the rest, and this man, Paul Kayard, says the biggest strength is what they're riding in. I think the biggest strength they have is the boat. The boat's a darn good boat. Like Buddy said, that boat is the product, really, of, of the whole fleet of boats, the 25 America's Cup boats that have been built. Um, they had the, they maximized the opportunity that the defender has, which is to declare their boat uh, at the very last moment, and therefore they can build boats late. Both America 3 and Kanza have been built subsequent to the challengers having to show their boats. And Buddy himself said that, um, you know, they've gotten a lot of good ideas off all the challengers and even maybe Stars and Stripes, and they've um, assimilated all those aspects and the good attributes, hopefully, into America 3. And for that reason, she's the fastest boat in town. And maybe the white boat, USA 23, which we're on board right now, will break the 1-1 deadlock in about two hours, take a 2-1 lead in the best of seven. We talked about the 65 to $70 million, the reported budget. Look at this, the original budget of $15 million with a contingency for $20 million. Well, how about another $50 million to get where we are today? As of May 11th, they have over 30,000 contributors, donators around the country, corporate donations. They don't have really corporate sponsors. They have corporate donors, the foundation donations. And out of Mr. Koch's personal funds, $10 million, the reported figure. There is an America Cube Foundation that Bill Koch has established that will stay in place long after this event. And one of the things that Bill is interested in promoting, youth sailing, he's very active in that, Peter, and also handicap sailing. In fact, they had a race with handicap sailors here in San Diego between the finals and the America's Cup match. Right now, Bill Koch's white boat beating Raul Gardini's red boat, leg one, race three. American Cube, Jerry Kirby sailed on board Eagle with Rod. Gary Jobson, since we've been away to your eye, has the white boat stretched out even further? I think she has, Jim. She's doing a very nice job here. The breeze continuing to build over 10 knots now. And I think American Cube going faster as the breeze continues to build. Don't forget, then we go up to the top mark after this first beat to windward, and we go three and a quarter nautical miles downwind with the Spinnakers and the Jennikers out. And that's where we think America Cube has been 30 seconds faster than that boat, the red boat, over the first two races. In these stronger winds here, we could see the spinnakers, the more symmetrical shaped sail. And maybe with those sails up, uh, more might be more competitive. The grinders today, Rick Brent, Rock Ferrigno, John Huffnagel, and Larry Mialek. Back then, looking at the crew list, no changes from Saturday. Where the grinders are in positions six through nine. Rick Brent, they call him Proton. He bench presses 325 pounds. Rock Ferrigno, his uncle Lou, was the incredible Hulk. John Huffnagel, he of course with Dennis aboard Liberty back in 1983. Larry Mialik, the ex NFLer, played with the Chargers here, good friends with Charger General Manager Bobby Bethard, played with the Falcons for a while. And don't bother Audrey Huffnagel up there in Marblehead, Mass, when she's watching her television set. Do not call, do not knock at the front door. She is glued to her set. Peter, let's check in with our sail track. You can see A3 up there, about nine and a half, ten knots. Jim, that blue track there, what A3 has done once the way it got to this first cross area right here, was they pushed Omoro to get out towards the right side of the course. This is the ley line right here. Once they can get Omoro to the ley line, they can in fact force Omoro to do two extra tacks. So a tactical maneuver on the part of Dave Dellenbaugh. 
Josh Kayard off to the right side of the course. Anything at all that Paul Kayard can do to counter that? Well, he's doing that right now, and Gary, it appears like Kayard may be in a bit of the backwind coming off the sails of American Cube. Do you think he has clean wind there? Uh, no, I don't. I think he's definitely hurting right now, and we're directly behind the boat. We're watching him kind of scallop up and down a little bit, so I think the exhaust coming off American Cube definitely affecting El Moro right now. Did we do a cut? Thank you. that called? It's the Dimeter, a statimeter. It's a hundred-year-old device with a couple of mirrors on it, measured range. We are gaining. There's Rick Brent. Behind him, main sheet trimmer. Andreas Josenhans. Gained a quarter of a boat length here. About a minute, 15 seconds to the mark for America Cube. The world looks to be about a minute behind now, that. Bill's staying down plenty low. <laughs> He's already been knocked silly in one race. They put some ice under his white cap. You heard him in the pre-start that he was hit. Probably hit again by the running backstay blocks. Those things move around quite a bit during the maneuvers. Those are the wires that hold up the mast on the backside. They're constantly adjusted and right at head level for the afterguard. Peter Craig, the mast band there. Jerry Kirby with a harness on, the bowman. First leg, three and a quarter miles to windward, then around that top mark. Then we come back to the bottom mark, three and a quarter miles with the spinnakers and jettakers out on the run. Very strong current up here by this mark. America Cube sailing directly into the current as they head for the mark. Tacking. He's over on port. And here goes Kayard. Right now, American Cube did Omoro heading off towards the top mark. They will come right up here, stay a little bit wide of the mark, turning down close, heading downwind. The goal here is to come into the mark wide and turn it sharp on the exit side. Bill Koch just said 9.7, so they picked up another full boat length, Gary. I think the big difference here is that the stronger wind is a favorite American cube, but she had the favorite side of the course. Kayard's mistake is not engaging early after the start and forcing a tacking duel. Her edge comes from mixing it up. And she was forced to play American Cube's game by not setting up the tacking duel. Gayard may be a bit psyched out as when American Cube gained on him on that rapid-fire tacking duel on Sunday. Around this top mark, we'll watch the crew work on both boats. way. Aaron has to turn down and get the little dose of bad wind off the sails of America Cube. Let's watch Italy's crew work here, Gary, and see if trailing by as big a margin as they are early, they're rattled at all. Both boats going for spinnakers. Delta. 
So those $20,000 finickers are out. 5,000 square feet of sale. They go downwind on the road by 47 seconds. USA 23 in front, breaking the 1-1 deadlock in about two hours. To get directly upwind of the mark. The man going aloft in the rigging of El Moro. Crew work on both boats is quite good, setting the spinnakers. We're right behind the boat. We'll watch carefully, see what he's doing. About halfway up the mast, the great Fontini. Lives in Tuscany on the west coast of Italy. This is his second America's Cup campaign. He was on board Azura back in 87. Uh, Jim, we're looking at the uh, man. We're right behind the boat here, and there's a split or a tear in the mainsail. And he's got a pair of uh, piece of cloth that's got sticky back on it, and he's putting that cloth so it doesn't chafe anymore against the mast, so it could possibly rip further. That's the tape he's applying there, that white square. This is not a dangerous area for a rip. He'll work to put another piece on the other side. up there about 55 or 60 feet. Alberto started sailing when he was 13 in the 470 class. What most of the Europeans begin their sailing careers in. Said he'll take a month off when this cup is over then start racing again. His wife Christina watching on the telecast over at Club Italia. That's tough work doing that trying to balance yourself while putting that patch on. One hand for yourself and one hand for the ship. Age-old expression for seamen. He was smart, too. He waited until they were on this downwind leg to go up there. It would have been a much tougher high wire act if they were doing going upwind at this time. It's very important for the rest of the crew to keep concentrating on boat speed, steering and trimming the sails, and not got wrapped up watching the man aloft. You can see right there that piece that's tied onto the wire there, that's what's been shaping through the sail. It must have been what caused the tear in the first place. And it wouldn't have affected their boat speed at all on that first leg. Gary made a good point. Most of the men down below, the other 15 crew members of El Moro, oblivious to what Alberto is working on. They have their own jobs to tend to. He's up there with that safety harness. Meanwhile, analyzing the speed of the two boats, speed through the water seems to be about even, but America Cube definitely sailing a lower course, and as a result, gaining. I'm not sure that Alberto's mom, Alma, watching back in Italy, thinks it's a very casual picture. Down in the pit, gold medal winner from Seoul, David Tizano, one of the grinders. Luca Dignani, the port trimmer, Lorenzo Masta, over on the starboard side. The great Fontini, as he's called, and his high wire act. Albi. Well, while he's hanging out, we'll hang around. It's leg number two, Robert Hotkins with a laser gun. Paul Caird with a look of concern behind by close to a minute. Keep your spinnaker sail, that big white sail, filled with air as you turn the boat. And it's not easy. The timing of the turn, the work of the trimmers and the grinders, and the bowman, crucial to keeping that sail filled. This is where America Cube had trouble on Saturday, on uh, Sunday, driving back and forth. And I think a big reason was Buddy Melga simply turning the boat too fast. But today, he's turning the boat much slower. And as a result, the jives look much better. This is a maneuver that the Cubans practiced yesterday. Bill Koch called jiving practice. Felt that it really cost his team the race on Sunday. Now the wind shadow, the blanketed wind from El Moro projecting just behind America Cube right now. So America Cube sailing in clear breeze by about a boat length. Cube going.
going about a half a knot faster downwind right now. Every time Elmora jibes, Dellenbaugh has to look and say, where is the wind shadow of American Cube? Right now, the bad air zone coming off the sails right here. So American Cube will jibe with their wind clear behind this time, it appears. Buddy Milk is doing a much better job turning the boat today. Gary, given the fact that the Cubans did practice their jibing yesterday and they were a little suspect with a couple of their jibes on Sunday, wouldn't KR be wise to just continue to try to expose that weakness? I think so, Jim, and he's doing just that right now, jibing back and forth. I mean, he's barely getting the boat up to speed. And the cardinal rule here is never jibe unless you're up to full speed. And if you can, jibe in a puff of breeze so you can accelerate a little sooner. I'd go with it, David. There goes K.R. again. One problem for American Cube is every time they sail, have to sail through the bad wind zone coming off El Moro's sail. So even though they set up so they have clear wind on the long straight line, they are getting a dose of bad wind every time El Moro jives and crosses behind. And a bad jive by America Cube, the spinnaker just now filling, but the whole thing collapsed on that turn. That's Bill Koch, whose voice you're hearing coming off of A3. He's working the coffee grinder, buddy at the wheel. This is actually quite an important leg for El Moro. 47 seconds behind at the top mark. And it's differential in time will be important to see if they were able to make progress with the new sail that they built over the last day. Spinnaker sail filled. All the while looking for a fast angle down to the next mark. Gary, about how long until mark two? We'll give American Cube about a, American Cube about a minute and a half from rounding the next mark. And Mark Walsh, our spotter here, who's uh, quite a famed bowman himself, points out that the difference is the Italians seem to jive their spinnaker pole before the mainsail shifts over, and American Cube jives the pole after the main goes over, and that seems to be the difference. Here's the Italians jiving right now. The pole's already across. It's hooked up, and now the main comes over. And as a result, very smooth jive. American Cube doing the opposite way, and they're not going quite as well. Leave it to a famed bowman to notice something like that, and it makes a big difference. Also, it appears that Omoro's mainsail goes out further as soon as it swings across. coming downwind now as we look down to the bottom mark it appears they're on the final ley line to the finish maybe no more jobs at this point they'll round that mark to the left and head back tacking up wind john spence the sewer man america cube took 10 stitches about two weeks ago what was called a comic kamikaze takedown the grinders had to cut the sheets loose 10 stitches in his hand Back the next day, Wally Henry, left side of your screen. Rick Brent, Mr. Proton there in the center, the blonde. See that yellow, little yellow airplane sometimes on the onboard camera? That's Wally Henry's airplane. It was given to him by Jerry Kirby's son. Good luck charm. Current about three quarters of a knot right here, setting both boats toward the right side of the screen. And that'll be a factor in this rounding. There's Wally's airplane on the boom bang rod and a course change signaled by the committee boat. Spinnakers out. Then we go around the second mark. We go back to windward for the second time on leg number three. That's a shorter windward beat, 2.75 miles. In race one on Saturday, America Cube increased their lead 10 seconds on this spinnaker run from 31 to 41 seconds. Again, 47 seconds, the delta at the top mark. A3 did a good job at the start, got to the left side. 
Hayard let A3 go. Mark two. Driving work, six seconds, but still a big lead. We go back to Windward for the second time. Two and three quarter miles. The Red Boat, the champion. Start here, much of the advantage because they were on opposite tacks. America Cube at the bottom of the screen, going off to the left side of the course, El Moro on the right side. And although America Cube tacked soon after the start, they had the left-hand position and round that top mark, 47 seconds in front. So the men of America cubed out in front by 47 seconds at the top mark. Then the jibing duel instituted by Paul Kayard and the men of El Moro di Venezia. Around that bottom mark a few seconds ago, 41 seconds the Delta. So the Italians picked up six seconds. We go back to windward for the second time. 2.7 mile, 2.75 nautical miles. And the spectator fleet all enjoy. America Cube won the first race by 30 seconds. El Moro on Sunday, the closest race in America's Cup history. Three ticks on the clock. It's a best of seven, really reduced now to a best of five. Good job by Dave Dullenbaugh and by Buddy Belgus at the start. Almost about a six boat length lead, eh, Peter? Incredible. That's the difference you can gain if you can pick the right, the proper side of the course. And the first time El Moro converged, they already had a good four to five boat length lead. Possibly even six. We can see there America Cube sailing upwind very fast right now. The owner, Bill Coke, with his laser rangefinder. We're up to 8.2 ahead of him again. 8.2 boat lengths. He said the process is democratic to a point, but then there's one vote, his, that carries the day. America Cube, the only multiple boat program for the defense. For a time, they had as many skippers as they had boats. Bill Coke, the visionary, he wants to drive. But it's been Buddy Melgus that's emerged as the steadying influence with the Cubans' parts is parts philosophy. Why the delay in naming the afterguard? Well, what I was trying to do was to, to get everybody to learn how to work together, to get them seeing what the right chemistry is, what they have to do. And I was trying to break down the, the history or the, the culture that has developed over a number of years in the star system. Uh, and I've done that. Coke with three brothers and his father built the family oil empire into a $250 million company. Bill went to Culver Military Academy where he graduated third in his class and following a family tradition attended MIT. The brothers Koch spearheaded academic, intramural, and social activities. Bill then joined Sigma Chi Engineering Society and his fraternity of choice, Beta Theta Pi. But both were far from bookworms. Bill and his brother David played on the engineer's basketball team. David, their leading scorer and rebounder. Bill graduated in the top 10% of his class and was consistently on the dean's list. He would pursue his doctorate in chemical engineering. Family vacations took the Cokes game hunting. Armed with three degrees from MIT, Bill broke from the family business and began his own company and amassed his own personal fortune. With that wealth and backed by MIT technology, Coke came a calling. Others in this cup campaign of equal wealth, Sir Michael Fay of New Zealand and Raul Gardini of Italy have different perspectives on their respective roles. You have spent a considerable amount of money and you've decided to sail. How do you compare yourself with your contemporaries? Well, I guess I'm a unusual, either an unusual guy or maybe an anachronism. Uh, uh, some of the old guys used to say, who spent the money uh, would, would sail. Uh, I sail because I love it, and I love being part of the team. 
maybe a small part of the team, but I still love being there. If Bill Koch has a weakness, what would that be? Well, um, I, I got a lot of them, as, as, as everybody does. Um, sometimes I get a little angry, get a little impatient, uh, uh, get easily frustrated. Um, sometimes uh, uh, fall in love too much with a few dreams. Now his dream has become reality. He has emerged out from under Dennis Connor's shadow. Only El Moro and Paul Kayart stand between Bill and Yachting's Holy Grail and the sweet taste of victory again. Let's look at sail track here. The uh, attacking duel is starting to get to be more intense than we saw in that first leg. Kayard evenly spacing out his attacks, probably waiting until he's up to full speed, taking about 30 seconds in this much wind speed before he tacks back again. Any quicker and he'd lose some. But those notes, I think they're notes and numbers for the navigator helped buy Baldridge with his computer work. Taped to the back deck of America Cube. Now, Kayard's actually doing quite well in this tacking duel, and it just begs the question of why he didn't do it. Well, we got an override here on the gym. On, on Fort Elmora, we have an override. They're still pulling the sail in, but they're going to have a take about a minute to untangle the mess on the winch. We have the ley lines coming emanating from the top mark, and K are doing a good job keeping the race in the center of the course, avoiding those ley lines like the plague. Once you get there, no more tacking duels allowed. It's a straight line to the mark. Mike Topa trimming over aboard USA 23 and his counterparts. Luca Dignani, the port trimmer, Lorenzo Machta, starboard trimmer aboard ITA 25. Good opportunity for America Cube to stretch out here by not packing and covering because they're almost at the mark and El Moro forced to make two extra tacks. The amount of money spent on the sales for that leg is ridiculous and every other match race we got in the world as windward lures with good reason that's when you have the best racing and the best opportunity for passing so i think the reach legs ought to disappear the z legs that we are talking about four five and six not as close as they appear from that camera angle coming into mark number three by America Cube to make the extra tack because they're going to force El Moro to sail in some bad air for the last minute and a half to get to this mark. JR can't take it. He's going to tack away. Point Loma in the upper right-hand corner. There is Jerry Kirby, ex-hockey player. Keep our eye on Bill Coke and see if Bill takes over the wheel. That's the reaching strut being set by Peter Craig. was 41 around mark number two. The way that spinnaker pole is resting on the Italian boat, it almost looks like a bowsprit. 
8-3, stretching out their lead by at least 15 seconds. Two men by the mast hauling up the rope that hoists the new sail. Okay. So the tacking duel didn't do a thing for KR on that second beat to windward. They come down, heading on, a, appears a, as if a bit of a wind shift, but on a straight line track for the next mark on this reaching leg. Bill Koch has taken over the wheel from Buddy. We're on the broad wheat. Leg number four, 55 seconds. The white boat defending for the San Diego Yacht Club. reach a broad reach down came the Jennikers the jive out came the Hetzel choice very critical when we get down to that fourth mark eh Pedro absolutely and right now America keep going with a third sail that one set between the Jenniker and the main sail is called a staysail perfect time to put it up and Mr. Koch is on the helm well I imagine folks like Larry Leonard and well take a look reaching sailing across the wind the fastest point of sail we'll see that on leg number five right now they're on the broad reach the wind coming slightly from behind the dead abeam the 90 degree angle on the next leg the wind will be much farther forward and they'll have to change the type of sail they're using up front setting a Jenniker a tight reaching Jenniker and as Gary pointed out it'll be interesting to see if the Italians have a new sail in their inventory they've been blown away by America Cube's specialty sale for the fifth reaching leg. Talking about broad reaching, some people like to broad reach through life. You're not talking about Mr. Gardini, are you, Gary? He looks kind of relaxed for his position. 59 years of age, one of Europe's wealthiest men. You see him there with his tie on. He says, his tie is like his sense of humor. I was born with it. He has skied with a tie on. He said for him, it's the most comfortable thing around his neck. His collar may get a little tight if his red boat doesn't move a little faster around the race course. All even, one race apiece. Of course, he's serving in the 17th man position. We didn't have this in the 12 meter, but on the new AC class, you could have a non-participating rider, a 17th crew member. They have to wear a contrasting color, quickly stand out. And they're not allowed to help out at all, except investing more money in their campaign. Andrea Marani, the masked man there, he was with Italia back in 87. Stasel coming down aboard America Cube, getting ready for the sail change. Where we'll take this large Jenniker down and then put a smaller reaching sail up. I'll tell you what, the crew likes when this maneuver is done. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief when you get one sail down on deck and the other one up flying well. Larry Myalik in the center of the screen out of Madison, Wisconsin. He's the ex-NFL tight end, played for the Falcons and the Chargers. Here we come into mark number four after this one and a half mile first reaching leg. Eight three, it's been wire to wire so far. 55, the delta around mark number three. here 
on the sail. They're having trouble getting it down on America Cuban. Still up in the rig. Now finally coming down, but uh, a slow change. Gary, I think A3 was definitely faster on this first reach. And I noticed America Cube using a, a smaller reacher today, the one like the Italians used the other day. Again, 55, the Delta around Mark 4. Divers okay there. One oh four, so nine seconds faster. USA twenty three on leg number four. America Cube so far, Peter, faster on three of the four legs. One fast boat. Dennis Connor found out. Paul Kayard found out. We're seeing it right now as the old sail comes down here. So they call a Casper takedown on board Stars and Stripes. Cover everybody with white. So the Hensels are out. We're now on the close reach. We head down to mark number five. That's the right-hand turn. A3 in front by 64 seconds. Race three. We are on leg number five, the fastest point of sale, the second reaching leg. This is a close reach. America cubed in front by 64 seconds around mark number four. It's been all A3. They were ahead by 47 seconds at the top mark. But let's go back to that fourth mark because while we were going to commercial, watch what happens. Red protest flag. That's a technical protest. Our diver... Bob Sloan in the water. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, it appears the K-Art actually had to turn wide of the mark there. You can see Bob Sloan, the cameraman, in the water here. K-Art had to cut the mark a bit wider in order to avoid hitting him. And about a minute later, we saw a protest flag. Look at his reaction as he turns around, saying, what's that guy doing on the grace course? Mr. Gardini wonders, too. And about... 40 seconds later, once Robert Hopkins was done with his duties, he went back and put up the red technical protest flag that you could see flying behind K.R.'s right arm there. And there the on-the-water judges were right there, but the red protest flag is a technical protest. That is not going to the uh, on-the-water judges. That is a protest that will be heard. But I think, Peter, to be perfectly honest, uh, the certainly 64 seconds behind should not matter. That's right. I, I would be very surprised for the umpires that, uh, if the race stays as it is right now. Right, if it stays the way it is, if, if it comes down to a two or three second victory, as we had on Sunday. Jim, the problem that the diver had there is that the current was sweeping him. He jumped in the water before the mark, and the current just swept him away. And I think it was probably quite a shock to him that he was on the wrong side of it by the time the boats came. Check our ESPN sail track now. E3 moving along almost at 12 knots and a full knot behind El Moro. Now heading on the longest of the three reaching legs, 2.29 miles across with the wind coming on the left side of the boat. Tight reaching sails hoisted on the front. Both of them not going for the larger sails, but the top of the sail going only up to the pounds area, three quarters of the way to the top of the mast. There you can see the wire that actually holds up the top of the sail. So Kayard and his red hull boat only able to shave six seconds off of A3's lead on the second leg that was on the run. Downwind with the spinnakers out. Otherwise, A3 increasing her margin on three out of the four legs so far. Jim, out here on the fifth leg here, I'm standing with Tom Wood. And Tom, what were your impressions after the start? I mean, why in the world did KR not initiate attacking goal? Well, Gary, usually what you look for is uh, the first thing, look at the other boat and see if you're ahead or behind. Generally, if you're behind, you don't attack right away. 
Dave Dillenbaugh on America 3 looked over, saw they were ahead of the red boat, tacked right away, and I think what happened is that as the beat ensued, the wind went left a little bit. So KR being behind, got a little further behind as the wind went left. Now you're a sailmaker, and uh, Il Moro here has three new sails for this race. Can they make up this kind of speed difference with sails alone? I don't think so, Gary. I think what you're going to have to see today is a breakdown or some huge error on America 3 to close up this race. You notice Paul uh, worked on his downwind speed a little bit today and actually gained on the first run. But that's a tall order to uh, catch up to America Cube today. She's a fast boat. I have to ask you, since you're out here watching an America's Cup final since the first time since 1980, you've been on all of them. What's it like for you? What's your emotions watching this race? Well, Gary, I, I got to tell you, it's fun to be with you, but boy, I miss it. Um, one thing, seeing America Cube go so fast here against the Challenger makes us feel uh, a little better about our Stars and Stripes performance and probably means that our team was pretty competitive after all. Based on what you see here, do you think that uh, Il Moro has a chance to win this regatta? I still think so. I think that uh, good sailing ability has a lot to do with these races. You'll see that this race was out of touch in the first uh, five, seven minutes. So uh, I think if Paul has a similar break in a later race, he'll be right there out ahead again. Of course, you remember back in 1983, the score was 3-1, to one, uh, Australia 2 up against you guys, and they were able to come back too. Yeah, I think what happened there, Gary, is that the fast boat usually prevails if everybody's sailing pretty equally. I think uh, Australia 2 was very fast that year, but I don't think they were really sure, sure of themselves. I don't think they had a lot of self-confidence early on the regatta. As the regatta went on, they found that they were fast. They felt a lot better about their performance and prevailed. Okay, well, we'll go back and watch this uh, change here going around the fifth mark. One of the on-the-water judging boats ducking in there behind America Q. Mark number five, the delta was 64 seconds around Mark four. You see, once again, Bill will come into this mark wide, giving it a good distance, and then cut tight around it for his exit. And this turn here, very critical to how quickly the new sail fills. Helmsman has a lot to do with this maneuver. It's like John got a little wet there on the reaching leg. Sewer men have a tendency to do that. He's kind of the Ed, Ed Norton of sailing. Jive, set the spinnaker or the jenniker, and we start our citizen watch. 104, the time around Mark 4. Looks like it's going to be a lot closer than that, doesn't it, Jim? No question that El Moro has gained on that second reach. The close reach. 